Introduction of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates. By way of introduction. Sometime in the month of July, 1812, nearly a hundred years ago now, a well-dressed, smooth-spoken man, less than thirty years of age, made his appearance at Windsor, Nova Scotia. He was looking for employment, but gave those who inquired about his antecedents but little satisfaction, further than he had recently come from England, and could do almost anything in a mechanical way, and was familiar also with farm work. He was engaged under the name of Frederick Henry Moore by a farmer named Bond, who resided in the village of Rodden, and remained there about a year without attracting unusual attention except for his piety. Elizabeth, the daughter of his employer, became enamored with the stranger Moore, and on March 12, 1813, they were married, much against the will of her parents and friends. After his marriage, Moore took up the occupations of peddler and tailor, which gave him an opportunity to travel about the country and to make frequent excursions to Halifax, where he appears first to have turned his remarkable talent as a thief and burglar to profitable account for upwards of a year before he was detected. He escaped the clutches of the law in Nova Scotia, and reached St. John in July 1814. Less fortunate in his operations in New Brunswick than he had been in Nova Scotia, he was arrested and lodged in Kingston Jail on July 24, 1814, on a charge of horse-stealing, which in those days was punishable by death. Here he gave the name of Henry Moore Smith. Walter Bates was then sheriff of Kings County, and it is to him that the public is indebted for the story of this many-sided man, who is beyond all question the most remarkable person ever confined in a New Brunswick prison. Before he could be placed on trial, Smith effected his escape by an assumed illness, which deceived even the doctor in attendance. Supposed to be dying, he was left alone for a short while jumped from his supposed deathbed, and ran from the prison, eluding his captors for nearly two months before he was again landed in prison. On his return to jail, he broke the chains with which he was secured, removed an iron collar which had been riveted about his neck, and while loaded with chains, almost escaped by sawing the iron gratings on the windows of his cell. All these performances are vouched for by Sheriff Bates and Jailer Dibble, in whose custody he was, and attested by many of the most prominent residents of Kingston a century ago. The marionettes he made, while feigning insanity after he had been sentenced to death, were the wonder of hundreds, who not only saw them but were present in his cell when he made them perform. It was not so much the puppet show which caused astonishment, as that the puppets could be made by a man whose only materials at hand were the straw in his bed and strips torn from his clothing, all made while he was handcuffed and chained to the floor of his cell by heavy ox chains. Although convicted and sentenced to death, Smith was pardoned and escorted to St. John by Sheriff Bates and placed on a schooner bound for Windsor, his former home. This was on August 30th, 1815, more than a year after his arrest. Although he was within a few miles of the residence of his wife, it does not appear that he even visited her, but after short stay in Nova Scotia, left the province and made his appearance in Maine. Occasional glimpses of his life in the United States are given by Sheriff Bates in his narrative, the most interesting of which occurred in Connecticut, where he gave the authorities about as much trouble as he did those of New Brunswick. During his career he was heard of at points so widely divergent as the southern states and upper Canada. The last information of him 
was in what is now the province of Ontario nearly twenty years after he had quitted Kingston, where he was still plying his trade of theft. The story as told in subsequent pages by Sheriff Bates is unique in criminal annals and is worthy of careful perusal. The Publisher End of Introduction Chapter 1 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger, by Walter Bates. Chapter 1 The Mysterious Stranger Arrives at Windsor, Nova Scotia, Obtains Employment, Professes Religion, and Marries. Suspected of theft, he leaves Nova Scotia, comes to St. John, returns to Nova Scotia, and is arrested there by the New Brunswick authorities and lodged in Kingston Jail. Henry Moore Smith, the noted individual who forms the subject of this narrative, made his first appearance among us in the year 1812. Previous to this, we have no information concerning him. Sometime in the month of July in that year, he appeared at Windsor in Nova Scotia looking for employment and pretended to have emigrated lately from England. On being asked what his occupation was, he stated that he was a tailor, but could turn his hand to any kind of mechanical business or country employment. He was decently clothed, genteel in his appearance, and prepossessing in his manner and seemed to understand himself very well. Although an entire stranger, he seemed to be acquainted with every part of the province, but studiously avoided to enter into close intimacy with any person, associated with few, and carefully concealed all knowledge of the means by which he came to this country, and also of his origin and connections keeping his previous life and history in entire obscurity. Finding no better employment, he engaged in the service of Mr. Bond, a respectable farmer in the village of Rodden, who agreed with him for a month on trial, during which time he conducted himself with propriety and honesty, was industrious, careful, and useful, to the entire satisfaction of Mr. Bond, his employer, and even beyond his expectations. He was perfectly inoffensive, gentle, and obliging, using no intoxicating liquors, refrained from idle conversation and all improper language, and was apparently free from every evil habit. Being engaged for some time in working on a new road with a company of men whose lodging was in a camp, rather than subject himself to the pain of their loose conversation in the camp, he chose to retire to some neighboring barn, as he pretended, to sleep in quiet and was always early at work in the morning. But, as the sequel will discover, he was very differently engaged. A ready conformity to Mr. Bond's religious principles, who was a very religious man of the Baptist persuasion, formed an easy yet successful means for further ingratiating himself into the favor of Mr. Bond and his family. His attendance on morning and evening prayers was always marked with regularity and seriousness, and in the absence of Mr. Bond he would himself officiate in the most solemn and devout manner. This well-directed aim of his hypocrisy secured for him almost all he could wish or expect from this family. He not only obtained the full confidence of Mr. Bond himself, but gained most effectually the affections of his favorite daughter, who was unable to conceal the strength of her attachment to him, and formed a resolution to give her hand to him in marriage. Application was made to Mr. Bond for his concurrence, and although a refusal was the consequence, Yet so strong was the attachment, and so firmly were they determined to consummate their wishes, that neither the advice, the entreaties, nor the remonstrances of her friends were of any avail. 
She went with him from her father's house to Windsor, and under the name of Frederick Henry Moore, he there married her on the 12th of March, 1813, her name having been Elizabeth P. While he remained at Rodden, although he professed to be a tailor, he did not pursue his business, but was chiefly engaged in farming or country occupations. After his removal to Windsor and his marriage to Miss Bond, he entered on a new line of business, uniting that of the tailor and peddler together. In this character he made frequent visits to Halifax, always bringing with him a quantity of goods of various descriptions. At one time he was known to bring home a considerable sum of money, and upon being asked how he procured it, and all those articles and goods he brought home, he replied that a friend by the name of Wilson supplied him with anything he wanted as a tailor. It is remarkable, however, that in all his trips to Halifax he uniformly set out in the forenoon and returned next morning. A certain gentleman, speaking of him as a tailor, remarked that he could cut very well and make up an article of clothing in a superior manner. In fact, his genius was extraordinary, and he could execute anything well that he turned his attention to. A young man having applied to him for a new coat, he accordingly took his measure and promised to bring the cloth with him the first time he went to Halifax. Very soon after, he made his journey to Halifax, and on his return, happening to meet with the young man, he showed him from his portmanteau the cloth, which was of a superior quality, and promised to have it made up on a certain day, which he punctually performed to the entire satisfaction of his employer, who paid him his price and carried off the coat. About this time, a number of unaccountable and mysterious thefts were committed in Halifax, Articles of plate were missing from gentlemen's houses. Silver watches and many other valuable articles were taken from silversmith's shops, and all done in so mysterious a manner that no marks of the robber's hands were to be seen. Three volumes of late Acts of Parliament, relating to the Court of Admiralty, were missing from the office of Chief Justice Strange about the same time. He offered a reward of three guineas to any person who would restore them, with an assurance that no questions would be asked. In a few days after, Mr. Moore produced the volumes, which he said he had purchased from a stranger, and received the three guineas reward without having to answer any inquiries. This affair laid the foundation for strong suspicions that Mr. Moore must have been the individual who committed those secret mysterious thefts which produced so much astonishment in various quarters. And just at this crisis, these suspicions received not only strong corroboration, but were decidedly confirmed by the following fact. While the young man whom he had furnished with the new coat, as was previously noticed, was passing through the streets of Halifax with a coat on his back, he was arrested by a gentleman who claimed the coat as his own, affirming that it had been stolen from him some time since. This singular affair, which to the young man was extremely mortifying and afflictive, threw immediate light upon all those secret and unaccountable robberies. A special warrant was immediately issued for the apprehension of Moore, However, before the warrant reached Rodden, he had made his escape, and was next heard of as traveling on horseback, with a portmanteau well filled with articles which he offered for sale, as he proceeded on his way to the River Philip. And early in the month of July, 1814, he made his appearance in St. John, New Brunswick, by the name of Henry Moore Smith. He did not, however, enter the city with his horse, but put him up and took lodgings at the house of one Mr. Stackhouse, who resided in a by-place within a mile of the city, and came into the town upon foot. He found means to become acquainted with the officers of the 99th Regiment, who, finding him something of a military character, and well acquainted with horsemanship, 
showed him the stud of horses belonging to the regiment. Smith, perceiving that the pair of horses which the colonel drove in his carriage did not match, they being of different colors, and one of them black, observed to the colonel that he knew of an excellent black horse in Cumberland that would match his black one perfectly. The colonel replied that if he were as good as his own, he would give fifty pounds for him. Smith then proposed that if he, the colonel, would advance him fifteen pounds, he would leave his own horse in pledge and take his passage in a sloop bound for Cumberland and bring him the black horse. To this the colonel readily consented and paid him down the fifteen pounds. This opened the way to Smith for a most flattering speculation. He had observed a valuable mare feeding on the marsh contiguous to the place where he had taken his lodgings, and cast his eye upon a fine saddle and bridle belonging to Major King, which he could put his hand on in the night. With these facilities in view, Smith entered on his scheme. He put himself in possession of the saddle and bridle, determined to steal the mare he saw feeding on the marsh, ride her to Nova Scotia, and there sell her, then steal the black horse from Cumberland, bring him to the colonel, receive his two hundred dollars, and without loss of time transport himself within the boundaries of the United States. This scheme, so deeply laid and so well concerted, failed, however, of execution, and proved the means of his future apprehension. Already in possession of saddle and bridle, he spent most of the night in fruitless efforts to take the mare which was running at large in the pasture. Abandoning this part of his plan as hopeless and turning his horse-stealing genius in another direction, he recollected to have seen a fine horse feeding in a field near the highway as he passed through the parish of Norton, about thirty miles on, on his journey. Upon this fresh scheme he set off on foot with the bridle and saddle in the form of a pack on his back passing along all the succeeding day in the character of a peddler. Night came on, and put him in possession of a fine black horse, which he mounted and rode on in prosecution of his design, which he looked upon now as already accomplished. But with all the certainty of success, his object proved a failure, and that through means which all his vigilance could neither foresee nor prevent. From the want of sleep the preceding night and the fatigue of traveling in the day, he became drowsy and exhausted and stopped in a barn belonging to William Fairweather at the bridge that crosses the mill stream to take a short sleep and start again in the night so as to pass the village before daylight. But as fate would have it, he overslept, and his horse was discovered on the barn floor in the morning and he was seen crossing the bridge by daylight. Had he succeeded in crossing in the night, he would in all probability have carried out his design, for it was not till the afternoon of the same day that Mr. Knox, the owner of the horse, missed him from the pasture. Pursuit was immediately made in quest of the horse, and the circumstance of the robber having put him up at the barn proved the means of restoring the horse to his owner and committing the robber to custody, for there at Mr. Fairweather's information was given which directed the pursuit in the direct track. Mr. Knox, through means of obtaining fresh horses on his way, pursued him, without loss of time, through the province of Nova Scotia, as far as Picto, a distance of 170 miles, which the thief had performed with the stolen horse in the space of three days. There, on the 24th of July, the horse having been stolen on the 20th, Mr. Knox had him apprehended by the deputy sheriff, John Parsons, Esquire, and taken before the county justices in court then sitting. Besides the horse, there were a watch and fifteen guineas found with the prisoner, 
and a warrant was issued by the court for his conveyance through the several counties to the jail of King's County, province of New Brunswick, there to take his trial. Mr. Knox states that he, the prisoner, assumed different names and committed several robberies by the way, that a watch and a piece of Indian cotton were found with him and returned to the owners, that on the way to Kingston jail he made several attempts to escape from the sheriff, and that but for his own vigilance he never would have been able to reach the person with hint, observing at the same time that unless he were well taken care of and secured, he would certainly make his escape. He was received into prison for examination on the warrant of conveyance without a regular commitment. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andrew Wade. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates. Chapter 2 Examination before Justice Pickett and Ketchum and commitment for trial would not join the 112th Regiment to secure freedom. Before the trial was attacked by a strange disease, baffled physicians. Supposed to be dying, he escapes from the jail. The prisoner had rode all day in the rain, and having no opportunity of changing his clothes, by which this time had become very wet, it was thought necessary, lest he should sustain injury, to be put into the debtor's room, handcuffed where he could have all opportunity of warming and drying himself at the fire, the stove having been out of repair in the criminal's room. The day following, he was removed into the criminal's room, where irons were considered unnecessary, and as he appeared quite peaceable, his handcuffs were taken off, and being furnished with a comfortable berth, he seemed reconciled to his situation. On the 13th of August, I received the following letter from the clerk of the circuit court. Dear Sir, Mr. Knox has left the examination, etc., relating to Moore Smith, the horse dealer, now in your jail. These are all taken in the province of Nova Scotia before magistrates there, and I recommend that he be brought up before the magistrates in your county, and examined, and the examination committed to writing. I do not know under what warrant he is in your custody, but I think it would be as well for the same magistrates to make out a mitimus after the examination, as it would be more according to form. I remain, dear sir, yours, Ward Chapman. After proper notice, Judge Pickett, Mr. Justice Ketchum, and Mr. Knox all attended his examinations, in the course of which he said his name was Henry Moore Smith, twenty years of age, came of England on account of the war, and had been in America about a year and a half, that he was born in Brighton, and his father and mother were living there now, and that he expected them out to Halifax the ensuing spring, that he had purchased a farm for them on the River Philip, and had written to them to come. He also stated that he came to St. John on business, where he fell in with Colonel Daniel of the 99th Regiment, who proposed to give him $200 if he would bring him a black horse within a fortnight that he would span his own of the same color that he had told the colonel that he knew of one that would match his perfectly, and that if he would lend him 15 guineas, he would leave his own mare in pledge until he would bring the horse, as he knew there was a vessel then in St. John bound to Cumberland, where the horse was. To this proposal, he said the colonel agreed, and having received the money and left the mare, went to his lodgings. But before he could return, the vessel had left him, and having no other conveyance by water, he was obliged to set out on foot, and having a long journey to travel, but a short time to perform it in, he traveled all night, and at daylight was overtaken by a stranger with a large horse and a small mare, which he offered for sale, and that being weary with walking all night, offered him ten pounds for the mare, which he accepted that they continued their journey some time and began to find out that the mare would not answer his purpose, the horse being a good-looking one which he might sell again for money, he bantered the stranger for a swap, which was effected by giving the mare and fifteen pounds in exchange for the horse, saddle, and bridle. He then produced a receipt, which he said the stranger gave him, to the following effect. Received July 20, 1814, of Henry Moore Smith, fifteen pounds in swap of a horse between a small mare and a large horse. I let him have, with a star, six or seven years old. James Kerman. He then stated that he proceeded on to Cumberland, 
bargained for the black horse which was the object of his pursuit, and not having money enough to pay for him without selling the one he rode, and hearing that Captain Dixon of Truro wanted to purchase such a horse, and finding that he, Captain Dixon, had gone on to Pictou forty miles further and attended court. He was obliged to follow him with all speed. The next day, being Sunday, he was obliged to wait till Monday to sell his horse, and was there apprehended by Mr. Knox, and charged with stealing his horse, that he was taken before the court, had all his money, his watch, and his horse taken from him, and sent back to King's County Jail to take his trial, and complained that as he was an entire stranger, and had no one to speak for him, unless the man was taken who sold him the horse, his case might be desperate, for he had neither friends nor money, nor anyone who knew to take his part. He complained of also having been badly used by Mr. Knox on the way. Having been asked by Mr. Knox in the course of his examination what occupation he followed in the country, he replied, no one in particular. Mr. Knox then hastily asked him how he got his living. He replied, with the great firmness and self-possession, by my honesty, sir, after this examination with a regular commitment was made out, and he returned to prison, he submitted to his confinement without a murmur, and with much seeming resignation, but complained of a great pain in his side occasioned by cold he had received. He seemed anxious for an opportunity to send for his portmanteau, which he had said he had left with some other articles in the care of Mr. Stackhouse near St. John. The portmanteau, he said, contained his clothes, which he would be obliged to sell to raise money for the purpose of procuring necessaries and engaging a lawyer, repeating again that, as he was a stranger and had no friends to help him, there would be but little chance for him, though innocent, except the thief who stole the horse, was taken and brought to justice. So it happened on the day following that I had the occasion to go to the city of St. John in the company with Dr. Adino Paddock Sr., when on our way he had the occasion to call on Mr. Nathaniel Golding's tavern in Hampton, and while placing our horses under his shed, we perceived a man mounting a horse in great haste that was standing at the steps of the door, who immediately rode off with all possible speed, as though he were in fear of being overtaken. On inquiring who he was, we were informed by Mrs. Golding that he was a stranger who had called there once or twice before, and that she believed his name was Chuman, or Cherman. I observed to the doctor that that was the name of the man with whom the prisoner Smith said he had purchased the horse, upon which Miss Golding said that she could ascertain that by inquiring in the other room, which she was requested to do, and was answered in the affirmative. We made frequent inquiries, by the way, as we proceeded toward St. John, but could ascertain nothing further of the stranger by that name. After my return from St. John, I informed the prisoner Smith of what happened by the way. He appeared exceedingly elated with the idea of his being the man that had sold him the horse, and said that if he had money or friends, he could have taken him and brought to justice, and would soon be restored to liberty again himself. But if he were suffered to make his escape out of the country, his own case would be deplorable indeed, though he was innocent. He again reiterated his complaint that he was destitute of money and friends in a strange country. Although anxious to employ a lawyer, he did not know of any to whom he could apply for advice. He was recommended to Charles J. Peters, Esquire, attorney in St. John, with the assurance that if there were any possibility in the case of getting him clear, Mr. Peters would exert himself in his behalf most faithfully. The first opportunity that offered, he sent an order to Mr. Stackhouse for his portmanteau with instructions to apply the proceeds of certain articles which he had left him for sale, if disposed of, in retaining Mr. Peters as his attorney. The return brought a handsome portmanteau with a pair of boots, leaving a small sum in the hands of Mr. Peters, as part of the retainer, which was to be increased to five guineas before the sitting of the court. This arrangement seemed to be productive of much satisfaction to the prisoner, and for the purpose of fulfilling the engagement with Mr. Peters, he expressed a desire to dispose of the contents of his portmanteau as far as it was necessary for making up the sum. He gave me the key with which I opened his portmanteau and found it well with various articles of valuable clothing, two or three genteel coats with vest and pantaloons of the first quality and cut, a superior top coat with the latest fashion, faced with black silk, with silk stockings and gloves, and a variety of boots consisting of a neat leather pocket Bible and prayer book, a London gazetteer, a ready reckoner, and several other useful books. He had also a night and day spyglass of the best kind, and a small magnifying glass in a 
tortoiseshell case with many other useful articles. Suspicions of his not having come honestly by the contents of his portmanteau was not the impression that was made, but rather he had been handsomely and respectably fitted out by a careful and affectionate parents, anxious for his comfort and happiness, and that he was, in all probability, innocent of the charge alleged against him. He soon commenced selling off his little stock, and for the purpose of affording him a facility, persons wishing to purchase from him were permitted to come to the wicked door through which he could make his bargain and dispose of his things. He never failed to endeavor to excite the pity of him who came to visit him. By representing his deplorable situation, he being reduced to the necessity of selling his clothes to raise the means of defending his innocence in a strange country from the unfortunate charge preferred against him. Nor did he fail on his purpose, for many, from pure sympathy for his unfortunate situation, purchased from him, and paid him liberally. Among those who came to see there was a young man who said he had known the prisoner in St. John, and professed to visit him from motives of friendship. He had access to him through the grates of the window, and some of the glass being broken, he could hold a free conversation through the grates. The last time he came, he carried off the night and day glass for debt, which he said he owed him while in St. John, but the probability was that he had given him a watch in exchange. The prison was then kept by Mr. Walter Dibble, a man of learning and talents, who for several years had been afflicted with a painful disease, so that for a great part of the time he was confined to the house, and frequently to his room in the county courthouse, where he taught a school by which means, together with the fees and prerequisites of the jail and courthouse, afforded afforded him a comfortable living for himself and family, consisting of his wife and daughter, and one son named John, about nineteen years of age, who constantly attended his father. It may be also necessary to mention that Mr. Dibble was one of the principal members of the Masonic Lodge held at Kingston, and was in high esteem among them. Besides, he was regarded by all who knew him as a man of honesty and integrity, and well worthy to fill any situation of responsibility or trust. I am induced to advert to those particulars of Mr. Dibble's character because I am in indebted to him for many of the particulars relative to the prisoner, because having had a person who could be relied on, there was less necessity for visiting the prisoner very frequently, which did not exceed once a week generally except upon special occasions. Shortly after the commitment of the prisoner, he was visited by Lieutenant Baxter, an officer of the New Brunswick Regiment, then recruiting at Kingston. The officer proposed to the prisoner to enlist him, as means by which he could be released from his confinement. The idea he spurned with contempt, and chose rather to await the issue of his trial, depending on his professed innocence of the crime for which he stood committed. He was, however, prevailed to write to his attorney on the subject, and received his answer that such measure was inadmissible and advised him to content himself and await the issue of his trial. He appeared much displeased with the abruptness of his attorney's answer, and seemed rather to look upon this short and summary reply as an indication of his displeasure with him, and as an omen that he, his attorney, by this time, September 7th, I received a letter from the clerk of the circuit court enclosing a precept to summon a court of oyer and terminer and general jail delivery to be held at Kingston on Tuesday the 27th of September on the approach of the period for his trial trial. He was encouraged by his friends to rely with full confidence on his attorney, with repeated assurances that he would give his case all possible attention. But with all his professed ignorance of the law, and this ignorance he had often declared with apparent simplicity, the prisoner knew too much of it to resign himself with confidence to the issue of the cause, which he could promise himself nothing but conviction and confirm his guilt. He therefore, upon his professed dissatisfaction with his attorney, appeared to think no more about him, not to renew his inquiries concerning him him, but to set a more summary method of extracting himself from the power of the law. He turned his attention to the Bible, and pursued it with an air of much seriousness, as though the concerns of this unseen world engrossed all of his thoughts. He behaved himself in every respect with becoming propriety, and his whole demeanor was such to engage much interest in his behalf. About this time he discovered symptoms of a severe cold being troubled with a hollow-sounding cough and complained of a pain in his side, but still submitted to his confinement without a murmur or complaint. He would frequently advert to the ill usage by which he said he had received by the way from Pictou after he had been made prisoner, particularly of a blow to the side with a pistol given by Mr. Knox, which felled him to the ground, as he expressed it, like a dead man, that when he had recovered his respiration he had been for some time suspended. He raised blood and continued to raise blood occasionally by the way for two or three days, that the pain had never left him since, and was, as he believed, approaching to be gathering 
bone in the inside, which he feared would finally prove fatal to him. He showed a bruised spot on his side which swelled and much discolored and apparently very painful. All of this was accompanying with the loss of appetite and increased feebleness of the body, but he still discovered a remarkable resignation to his fate. His situation was such to excite sympathy and feeling, so that an endeavor was made to render him as comfortable as possible by keeping his apartment properly tempered with heat and providing him with such food as was adapted to the delicacy of his constitution. His disease, however, continued to increase and his strength to decline and all the symptoms of approaching dissolution, pain in the head and eyes, dizziness with sickness at the stomach, frequent raising of blood, and increased painfulness of the contusion on his side. It was now considered high time to apply to a physician, and on the 11th of September, I sent for a doctor who examined his side and the general state of his disease, and gave him some medicine. On the 12th, he appeared a little better. 13th, at evening, grew worse. 14th, unable to walk. Very high fever, with frequent chills of ague. 15th, vomiting and raising blood more frequently. 16th, the Reverend Mr. Scoville visited him in the morning, found him very ill, and sent him toast and wine and some other cordials. Same day, the doctor attended him at three o'clock and gave him medicine. At six o'clock, no better, and vomiting whatever he took. 18th appeared to still grow worse, was visited by Judge Pickett and several other neighbors, and being asked whether he wanted anything or what he could take, answered nothing except an orange or a lemon. 19th appeared to decline very fast. At two o'clock, was visited by the doctor who said the man must be removed from that room and he was too ill to be kept there and that it was of no use to give him medicine in so damp a place 20th in the morning found him still declining at 10 o'clock mr thaddeus scribner and others went to see him inspecting the room but found no dampness that could injure even a sick man taking medicine the reverend mr scoville visited him in the afternoon and introduced the subject of his approaching end the prisoner conversed freely on the subject and expressed his conviction that there was little or no hope of his recovery he stated to mr scoville that he was born in england and that his parents were formerly attached to the church of england but had lately joined the methodist that he had came from england on account of the war and that he had expected his parents to come to the country next spring which last circumstance seemed to excite him in strong emotions twenty first the reverend mr scoville with others of the neighborhood visited him in the morning no favorable symptoms twenty second the prisoner very low violent fever accompanied with chills and ague inflammation of the bowels with evacuations of blood for the last two days extremities cold and strength greatly reduced insomuch that he could only just articulate above his breath was understood to say that should he die for want of medical assistance as the doctor had refused to attend him any more in that place and the sheriff refused to remove him his situation had by this time excited general sympathy and pity his seeming simplicity passiveness and resignation greatly contributing to produce the effect at six o'clock reverend mr scoville and a great number of the neighbors came and sat with him until ten o'clock and then let him with the impression that he would not live till morning friday twenty third went to the jail early in the morning found the prisoner lying on the floor naked and seemingly in great distress said he had fallen through pain and weakness and could not get up again he was taken up and carried to his bed appeared as though he would instantly expire continued in a low and almost lifeless state till five o'clock in the afternoon when he appeared to all present to be really dying reverend mr scoville mr perkins mr g raymond all near neighbors and mr eddy from st john who happened to be in kingston at the time all supposed him to be in the agonies of death he fell into a state of insensibility and continued so until a vial of hartshorn was brought from an adjoining room the application of which seemed to revive him a little after some time he recovered so far as to be able to articulate and upon being observed to him that he had a fit he replied he was sensible of it and it was his family infirmity and that many of his connections had died in the same way and further remarked that he did not think he could survive another which could probably come upon him the same time next day that he was sensible he should not recover but that god would have him he then asked mr scoville to pray with him his desire was complied with and a prayer offered up in the most solemn and devout manner the occasion was deeply affecting and all departed with the full conviction that the patient would not linger till the morning previous to this no regular watchers had attended him but it was now considered highly necessary that some person should sit with him till morning consequently john dibble and charles chambro were appointed by the sheriff to watch him through the night the next morning the following letter was dispatched to mr peters 
the prisoner's attorney. Dear sir, I fear we shall be disappointed in our expectations of the trial of the prisoner. Moore Smith at the approaching court. As I presume, more from appearance, he will be removed by death before that time. He is dying in consequence of a blow he received, as he says, from Mr. Knox, with a pistol which he has regularly complained of since he has been in jail, and is now considered past recovery. As it will be a matter of inquiry, and new to me, I will thank you to let me know by the bearer what would be necessary steps for me to take, and not fail, as I have but little hopes of his continuing till morning. Yours, Walter Bates. The return of the bearer brought the following. St. John, September 24th. Dear Sir, Your favor of yesterday I received this morning, and I am sorry to hear so desponding an account of the unfortunate man in your custody. It will be your duty, I conceive, to have a coroner's inquest on the body, and then have it decently interred. With respect to the cause of death, that is a circumstance which must rest wholly on facts. If any physician shall attend him, let him be particular in taking down in writing what the man says in his last moments as to the circumstances. And if a judge should then be present, it would not be amiss. In haste, yours sincerely, C.J. Peters. Saturday, 24th, the watchers reported he had passed a very restless night, but had just survived the morning. He had complained for want of medical assistance. The following note was then sent to the doctor who had attended him. Kingston, September 24th, 1814. Dear Doctor, Smith, the prisoner, says he is suffering from want of medical assistance, and that you will not attend him unless he is removed into another room, which cannot be permitted. He must take his fate where he now is, and if he dies in jail, an inquiry will take place, which may prove to your disadvantage. I must therefore request your attention. I am yours. Dr. A. Paddock, Jr., Walter Bates. At this time, the sympathy and compassion of the whole neighborhood was excited to the highest degree. The family of Reverend Mr. Scoville especially manifested a deep concern for him, and sent him everything they could that would either comfort or relieve him, as did also the family of Mr. Perkins, and that of Mr. Raymond, all of these having been in the immediate neighborhood. But the prisoner used little or none of their cordials or delicacies. Mr. Perkins visited him about 10 o'clock a.m., and kindly proposed to watch him the ensuing night, for which he discovered much thankfulness. In the course of the day, the doctor came and gave him some medicine but found him so weak that he required to be lifted and supported while he was receiving it. The doctor acknowledged his low state, but did not think him so near his end as to die before morning, unless he should go off in a fit. This, the patient said, was what he had reason to fear would be his fate before morning, and therefore wished to make his will. All his clothes at his death would be willed to John Dibble, and his money, about three pounds, which he always kept with him in his berth, be bequeathed to the jailer for his kind attention to him in his sickness. The money Mr. Dibble proposed to take charge of, but Smith said it was safe where it was for the present. Mr. N. Perkins, having the occasion to call that day on Mr. W. H. Lyon, was inquired of by him concerning the state of the prisoner. Mr. Perkins informed him that he was alive when he left him, but thought he would be dead before night. This information Mr. Lyon communicated the same evening to a number of persons who were assembled at the house of Mr. Scribner, and added that he was dead, for while he was on his way to Mr. Scribner's, it having been in the dusk of the evening, he had seen Smith's ghost pass by him at a short distance off without touching the ground. This singular report, as it came from a quarter, could not be well disputed, very much alarmed the entire company, and formed the subject of their conversation for the evening. But return to our narrative. After the prisoner had made his will, he was, for a short time, left alone, with the probability that he would be shortly seized by another fit, which he was not expected to survive. About six o'clock in the evening, the Reverend Mr. Scoville observed to his family that it was then about the same hour of the day at which Smith had his fit of the day proceeding, and that he thought he would die suddenly. He would therefore walk over to the courthouse and be ready there at the time, as it must be unpleasant for Mr. Dibble to be alone. This awakened the sensibilities of Mrs. Scoville, that she could not bear the reflection that a child of parents that were perhaps respectable should be so near her in a strange country sick and dying on a bed of straw. She therefore called Amy, her wench. Here, said she, take this feather bed and carry it to the jail, and tell Mr. Dibble that I have sent 
it for Smith to die on. Mr. Scoville had been in the house and seated with Mr. Dibble but a very short time when a noise was heard from Smith in the jail. John Dibble, who constantly attended him, ran in haste, unlocked the prison door, and found him in the agonies of a fit and almost expiring. He made an effort to speak and begged John to run and heat a brick that was near and apply it to his feet to give him one moment's relief while he was dying, for that his feet and legs were already cold and dead to the knees. John, willing to afford what relief he could to the dying man, ran in great haste from the jail through the passage round the stairway that led to the kitchen. There was a large fire of coals, which he cast the brick, waited but a few minutes, and returned with the heated brick to the prison. But to his indescribable astonishment, and almost unwilling to believe the evidence of his senses, the dying man had disappeared, and could not be found. John ran with the tidings to his father and Reverend Mr. Scoville, who were sitting in the room which the prisoner must have passed in his escape. They were entirely incredulous to the report of an affair so unparalleled, and would not yield their belief, until they had searched every corner of the apartment themselves, and found that Smith had not only effected his escape, but had also carried away his money, his boots, and every article of clothing away with him. It is impossible to conceive or describe the feeling of astonishment with which every one about the house was filled, when they found the man whom had been groaning and agonizing under the pain of accumulation of diseases, which night after night seemed to have been wasting his strength and bringing him nearer to the close of his unhappy life, had in a moment, and the very moment which was thought to be his last, seized the opportunity of his prison door being open, rushed from his confinement, leaving not a vestige of his movables behind him. As soon as a search through the prison confirmed the fact of the elopement, the inmates hastened outside and continued their search around the premises. At this moment, Amy the wench made her appearance, carrying the feather bed and seeing the people around the house, said to them, Mrs. Send this bed for Smith to die on. Her master told her to take it home and tell her mistress Smith was gone. Amy ran home and told her mistress that Massa say Smith dead and gone, and he no want in bed. Ah, exclaimed her mistress, poor man, is he dead? Then Amy, you may run and carry this shirt and winding sheet to lay Smith out in. Amy instantly obeyed and told her master accordingly, you may take them back said he. Smith is gone. Where he gone, Massa? I don't know, said he, except the devil has taken him off. Amy hastened back to her mistress and told her that Massa say Smith be dead and gone, and the devil taken him away. So much was the mind of everyone prepared to hear his death, that the expression Smith is gone served to convey no other idea. The sheriff himself, who had not been present and did not hear of the affair immediately, gave the sentence the same interpretation. A messenger having been dispatched to him with tidings met with him on his way to the jail, expecting to witness the last moments of the patient. On being informed by the messenger that Smith was gone, ah, poor fellow, he exclaimed, I expected it. What time did he die? But he is gone clear off. It is impossible, rejoined the sheriff, that he can be far from his sick bed. Why, replied the messenger, they were all about the jail looking for him, and no one could tell which way he had gone. Unparalleled and abominable deception, replied the sheriff. How did he get out of jail? He believed John Dibble left the door open while he ran to heat a brick, and then Smith made his escape. This was to us the first development of the true character of Henry Moore Smith, and thus, by means of counterfeit illness, which melted the feelings and drew the sympathies of the whole neighborhood, which baffled every power of detection and imposed even upon the physician himself, did this accomplished villain effect his release, and was now again running at large, glorying in the issue of his scheme. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of Henry Moore Smith, the Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bruce McCready. Henry Moore Smith, the Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates. Chapter Three. Pursued by officers of the law, his whereabouts are frequently discovered, but he eludes his pursuers. Commits a number of thefts. Taken before a magistrate, he makes satisfactory explanation. He goes on his way. The court convenes at Kingston before he is apprehended. But before we pursue his history and his succeeding adventures, it may be necessary for those who are unacquainted with the local situation of the jail from which the prisoner made his escape to give a short description of it. 
Kingston is situated on a neck or tongue of land formed by the River St. John and the Belle Isle Bay, running northeast and southwest on the western side of the neck, and by the Canopicasis, running the same course on the western side, leaving a tract of land between the two rivers about five miles in breadth and 30 miles in length. The winter road from Fredericton, the seat of government, to the city of St. John crosses the land at Kingston to the Canopicasis, and this road is inhabited on both sides. The road is intersected in the center of Kingston by another road running northeasterly to the head of Belle Isle Bay, and is also inhabited on both sides. At the intersection of these roads, on an eminence, stands the courthouse, under which is the prison, and church facing each other east and west at a distance of about eight rods. At the distance of about ten rods from the jail stands the house of Mr. F. N. Perkins to the north, and at an equal distance to the south the house of the Reverend E. Scoville is situated, with various other houses in different directions, the land clear all around to a considerable distance, affording no hiding place. From a prison thus situated and surrounded with dwelling houses did our hero escape, without any eye having seen him, and leaving no mark nor track behind which could direct in the pursuit of him. Finding ourselves unable to pursue in any direction, our conclusions were that he must have either taken the road to St. John or that leading to Nova Scotia the way by which he came, and the only road he was known to be acquainted with. Accordingly, men were dispatched in pursuit of him on the St. John Road, and others sent to different ferries, while I myself, with Mr. Moses Foster, the deputy sheriff, took the road toward Nova Scotia with all speed in the night and rode on until we began to think that we must have passed him. Having arrived at a house which he could not well pass without being seen, we stationed watchers there, and also set watchers in other stations, and maintained a close lookout all night, but to no purpose. At daylight, I furnished Mr. Foster with money and sent him upon the same road with directions to proceed as far as Mr. McLeod's tavern, distance forty miles, and in case of hearing nothing of him, to discontinue the pursuit and return. At the same time, I returned to Kingston myself, where I was informed towards evening that a man who answered his description had crossed the ferry over Belle Isle Bay the evening before in great haste, stating that he was going on an express to Fredericton and must be there by ten o'clock the next morning. This, compared with Mr. Lyon's story, the reader will recollect, of having seen Smith's ghost or apparition the same evening in the twilight, confirmed the opinion that we had now got upon the direction of our runaway. And when we remember further that the apparition was passing without touching the ground, we will have some idea of the rapidity with which our self-released hero was scudding along as he carried his neck from the halter. It was now Sunday evening, and he had twenty-four hours of a start, leaving little hopes of his being overtaken by me. As my only alternative, I forwarded advertisements and proposed a reward of $20 for his apprehension and recommitment to custody, but with very little prospect of success, knowing that he was escaping for his life and would succeed in getting out of the country before he would be overtaken. Monday morning, the 26th instant, Mr. Moses Foster returned from his route, and by this time many unfavorable reports concerning the prisoner's escape had begun to be circulated. The court at which he was to receive his trial was now to meet on the Tuesday following, and a jury summoned from different parts of the county for the express purpose of trying the horse-stealer. My whole time and attention were now required to make the necessary preparations for the court, and I felt myself not a little chagrined on reflecting on the circumstances in which I was placed. This feeling became heightened to a painful degree when I came to understand, by Mr. F. E. Jones, that the villain, instead of escaping for his life and getting out of my reach with all possible haste, had only traveled about ten miles the first night, and was seen lying on some straw before the barn of Mr. Robert Bales the next morning, on the road to Gagetown, having lain there till twelve o'clock in the day. 
But Smith did not lie on his bed of straw for rest merely. Even there, he was projecting fresh schemes of villainy, waiting for an opportunity to carry away some booty from the house of Mr. Bales. And so it happened that he did not miss his aim, for Mr. and Mrs. Bales had occasion to leave the house to go some distance, leaving the door unlocked. When the robber entered, broke open the trunk and carried off a silver watch, eight dollars in money, a pair of new velvet pantaloons, and a pocketbook with several other articles. He then walked leisurely on his way, stopping at the next house and at all the houses that were contiguous to the road, so that he did not make more than three or four miles before dark. When Mr. Bales returned to his house and found it had been robbed, he immediately fixed his suspicion on the man who had lain before the barn door from having observed the print of a boot heel which was thought to be his and gave the alarm to his neighbors. They immediately set out in pursuit of him, and having heard that he had been seen on the road at no great distance before them, they followed on in high spirits, expecting shortly to seize him. But in this they were disappointed, for the robber warily turned aside from the road, leaving his pursuers to exercise a painful and diligent search, without being able to ascertain which way he had gone. Having followed as far as Gagetown, they posted up advertisements, descriptive of his person, and also of the watch, and sent some of them on to Fredericton. Late on Sunday night, a man called at the house of Mr. Green, who resided on an island at the mouth of the Wash Demwalk Lake. He said he was a Frenchman, on his way to Fredericton about land, and called for the purpose of inquiring the way. Mr. Green informed him that he was on an island and that he had better stay till the morning and that he would then direct him on his journey. He made on a large fire by which the man examined his pocketbook and was observed to cast several pages into the fire and finally he threw the pocketbook also. Mr. Green, on seeing this, had an immediate impression that the man must be some improper character which idea was strengthened by the circumstances of its being a time of war. In the morning, therefore, he took him in his canoe and carried him directly to Justice Colwell, a neighboring magistrate, that he might give an account of himself. On his examination, he answered with so much apparent simplicity that the justice could find no just ground for detaining him and consequently dismissed him. He then made his way to an Indian camp and hired an Indian, as he said, to carry him to Fredericton, and crossing the river went to Vale's Tavern on Grimross Neck, where he ordered breakfast for himself and his Indian, and had his boots cleaned. At this moment Mr. Bales, whom he had robbed the day preceding, was getting breakfast at Mr. Vale's and writing advertisements in quest of the robber. About eleven o'clock, he, with the Indian, started again, leaving Mr. Vales unknown and undetected, but not without taking with him a set of silver teaspoons from the side closet in the parlor. The time was now come for the sitting of the court, and about eleven o'clock on Tuesday morning, the Attorney General arrived from Fredericton with very unfavorable impressions on his mind, bringing information that the robber was still traversing the country, stealing and robbing wherever he came, without sufficient effort being made for his apprehension. The jury also were collecting from the different parishes of the county, bringing with them unfavorable ideas from the reports and circulation concerning his escape. Among the many opinions that were formed on the subject, one particularly was very industriously circulated. The prisoner was a Freemason, and it will be recollected that Mr. Dibble, the jailer, was stated in a former part of the narrative to be a Freemason also, and that there was a Freemason lodge held at Kingston. The public mind was strongly prejudiced against us, unwilling to believe the real circumstances of his elopement, and the court assembled under the strongest impressions that his escape was connived at. The Honorable Judge Chipman presided on the occasion. The court was now ready for business, but no prisoner, yet high expectations were cherished that every hour would bring tidings of his apprehension, as he was pursued in every direction. The grand jury was impaneled, and the court adjourned till next day at eleven o'clock, waiting anxiously for the proceeds of the intermediate time, and to render the means for his apprehension as effectual as possible. 
Mr. Benjamin Fernald, with a boat well manned, was dispatched in the pursuit with directions to follow on as far as he could get any account of him. Wednesday, the court again met and commenced other business, but nothing from Smith yet. In the afternoon, Mr. John Pearson, witness against him, arrived from Nova Scotia, a distance of 280 miles. Towards evening, conclusions were beginning to be drawn that he had eluded all his pursuers and was making his way back to Nova Scotia, and the conjecture almost amounted to a certainty by the circumstance of a man being seen crossing the Washington Demwalk and making towards Belle Isle Bay. Nothing more was heard until Thursday morning early when Mr. B. Fernald returned and reported that he had found his course and pursued him through Maugerville that the night before he, Mr. Fernald, reached Margerville, the robber had lodged at Mr. Solomon Purley's and stole a pair of new boots and had offered the silver teaspoons for sale that he had stolen at Mr. Vale's, that he walked up as far as Mr. Bailey's tavern, where he stopped some time, and that he was afterwards seen towards the evening under a bridge, counting his money. This was the last that could be heard of him in this place. It was now believed that he had taken an Indian to pilot him and had gone by the way of the Washington Demwalk and head of Belle Isle for Nova Scotia. This was in accordance with the idea entertained at Kingston before Mr. Fernald's return. At 10 o'clock on Thursday morning, the court met according to adjournment to bring the business then before them to a close, without much hope of hearing any further of the horse-stealer at this time, when, about three in the afternoon, a servant of Mr. Knox's, who, it will be remembered, was the plaintiff in the cause, came direct to the court with information to his master that his other horse was missing out of the pasture, that he had been known to be in the pasture at one o'clock at night and was gone in the morning and that a strange Indian had been seen about the place. This extraordinary news produced much excitement in the court, and the coincidence of the Indian crossing the country with the robber with the Indian seen at Mr. Knox's confirmed the opinion that Smith had made himself owner of Mr. Knox's other horse also. Mr. Knox, on hearing this news, became exceedingly agitated, had no doubt that Smith was the thief again, would not listen to the sheriff, who was not just willing to credit the report of the horse being stolen, and affirmed that his life was in danger if Smith was suffered to run at large. His honor, the judge, expressed his opinion that great remissness of duty appeared. A general warrant was issued by the court, directed to all the sheriffs and ministers of justice throughout the province, commanding them to apprehend the said Moore Smith and bring him to justice. In the meantime, men were appointed to commence a fresh march in quest of him, to go in different directions. Mr. Knox, with Henry Lyon and Isaiah Smith, took the road to Nova Scotia, and Moses Foster, the deputy sheriff, and Nathan DeForest directed their course to Fredericton, by the head of Belle Isle Bay, with orders to continue their search as far as they could get information of him, or to the American settlement. The sheriff then wrote advertisements for the public papers, offering a reward of $40 for his apprehension, and the attorney general increased the sum to $80. Indictments were prepared, and the grand jury found a bill against the sheriff and jailer for negligence in suffering the prisoner to escape. They were held to bail to appear at the end of the next court of Oyer and Terminer to traverse the indictments. The business of the court being at the close, the sheriff paid the witness, Mr. Pearson from Nova Scotia, for his travel and attendance, amounting to $100, after which the court finally adjourned. End of chapter 3《Chapter 4 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates Chapter 4 Smith's wanderings through the province leaves a trail of larcenies, Arrested and brought before the court at Fredericton, he admits escaping from Kingston Jail and is sent back by Judge Saunders, escapes on the way, burglarizes the home of the Attorney General, and is rearrested.
and after a month of liberty is again placed in Kingston Jail. Nothing was heard of our adventurer till after the return of Mr. Knox with his party from a fruitless search of ten days in the province of Nova Scotia and as far as Ricky Bucto. The day following, Mr. Foster and Mr. DeForest returned from their chase and reported that after they had proceeded to within three miles of Fredericton, they heard of a stranger answering to his description, having lodged all night at a private house, but had gone on the road towards Woodstock. They continued the pursuit and found that he had stopped at Mr. Ingraham's tavern the night following, slept late in the morning, being fatigued, paid his bill and went off, but not without giving another proof of his characteristic villainy. He broke open a trunk, which was in the room adjoining the one he had slept in, and carried off a full suit of clothes belonging to Mr. Ingraham, that cost him forty dollars, and a silk cloak with other articles, which he concealed so as not to be discovered. This information gave his pursuers sufficient proof that he was indeed the noted horse-dealer, but Mr. Ingraham, not having missed his clothes immediately, the robber traveled on unmolested, and the next day went only as far as Mr. Robertson's where he found a collection of young people, played the fiddle for them, and remained the next day and night. He then proceeded towards Woodstock, leaving the spoons with Mrs. Robertson in exchange for a shirt, and taking passage in a canoe happened to fall in company with another canoe that had been at Fredericton, in which the Reverend Mr. Dibble, missionary at Woodstock, was passenger, with a young man pulling the canoe. The young man had seen Mr. Bale's advertisement at Fredericton, describing the man and watch which had a singular steel chain, and observed to Mr. Dibble that they both answered to the appearance of the stranger. Mr. D remarked to the young man that he might be mistaken, and asked the stranger to let him see the watch. The stranger handed the watch with all willingness, and it was found so exactly to answer to the marks of Mr. Bale's watch that Mr. D challenged it as the property of Mr. Bale's. Smith very gravely replied, that it was a favorite watch that he had owned for a long time, but that if he had heard of one like it having been stolen, he had no objection to leave it with him until he returned, which would be in about two weeks. Mr. D replied that the suspicion was so strong that he thought he would detain him also, until he could hear from Fredericton. Smith rejoined that he was on important business and could not be detained, but if he would pay his expenses and make himself responsible for the damage incurred by his detention, he would have no objection to stop till he could send to Fredericton. Otherwise, he would leave the watch as he proposed before and would return in ten or twelve days, during which time Mr. Dean might satisfy himself as to the watch. He appeared so perfectly at ease without discovering the slightest indications of guilt that on these conditions they suffered him to pass on. He continued his march until he came to the road that leads to the American settlement, and as it drew towards evening, he inquired of a resident by the way concerning the road to the American side, but was asked by the man to tarry till morning, as it was then near night and the settlement yet twelve miles distant. He did not choose to comply with the invitation, and advanced, as an apology, that two men had gone on before him, and he feared they would leave him in the morning if he did not proceed. It happened in a very short time after that two young men arrived there from the settlement, and being asked whether they had met two men on the road, they answered in the negative. It was then concluded that Smith was a deserter, and they turned about and followed him to the American settlement, but found nothing of him. The day following, Mr. Foster and Mr. DeForest arrived at Woodstock, and finding themselves still on the track of him, they pursued on to the American line, but could hear nothing concerning him. They then informed the inhabitants of Smith's character and proposed a reward of twenty pounds for his apprehension. The people seemed well disposed and promised to do their utmost. Mrs. F and D then made their way back to the river St. John, and there, most unexpectedly, came across the path of our adventurer again. They found that he had crossed the river, stopped at several houses for refreshments, and called himself Bond, that he had assumed the character of a pursuant in quest of the thief who had broken out of Kingston jail, said that he was a notorious villain and would certainly be hung if taken, and appeared to be extremely anxious that he should be apprehended. They traced him down to the river where the Indians were encamped, and found that he had agreed with an Indian to conduct him through the woods to the United States, by the way of Eel River, a route not infrequently traveled, and hence had baffled all the efforts of his pursuers, and finally escaped. Mrs. F. and D., thought it was now time to return and make their report. It afterwards appeared that the Indian, his conductor, 
after having gone about two days on the route, began to be aware of his job, perhaps finding that it might not be productive of much profit, and discovered that Smith carried a pistol, which he did not like very much, refused to guide him any longer, gave him back part of his money, and returned. This materially turned the scale with their adventurer and Fortin, that had hitherto smiled on his enterprise, refused, like the Indian, to conduct him much further. Unable to pursue his journey alone, he was, of course, obliged to return, and he had now no alternative but to try his chance by the known road. It was now the 10th of October, and he reappeared on the old ground, wanting refreshment and in quest, as he said, of a deserter. While his breakfast was preparing, information of his presence was circulated among the inhabitants, and Dr. Rice, who was a principal character in the place, effected his apprehension and had him secured. The clothes he had stolen from Mr. Ingraham he had on, excepting the pantaloons, which he had exchanged for a pistol. He said he had purchased the clothes very cheap from a man who believed was a Yankee. He was then taken in charge by Mr. A. Putnam and Mr. Watson, who set out with their prisoner for Fredericton. On their way, they stopped at the Attorney General's, three miles from Fredericton, and then proceeded into town, where the Supreme Court was then sitting. The prisoner was brought before the court in the presence of a large number of spectators. The Honorable Judge Saunders asked him his name, and he unhesitatingly answered, Smith, are you the man that escaped from the jail at Kingston? Yes. On being asked how he effected his escape, he said the jailer opened the door and the priest prayed him out. He was then ordered to prison for the night, and the next day he was remanded to Kingston Jail. Putnam and Watson set out with him in an Indian canoe, one at each end, and a prisoner handcuffed and pinioned, and tied to the bar of the canoe in the center. They were obliged to watch him the first night at the place where they lodged, and the next day they reached the house of Mr. Bales, opposite Spoon Island, where he had stolen the watch and the money, etc., it was near night, and the passage to Kingston rather difficult, and they being strangers, Mr. B. proposed that if they would stop with him till morning, he would conduct them to Kingston himself. They willingly complied, and having been up the preceding night, Mr. B. proposed that if they would retire and take some rest, he with his family would keep watch of the prisoner. After they had retired, the prisoner inquired the way to St. John, and whether there were any ferries on this side the river. He then asked for a blanket and leave to lie down. Mrs. B. made him a bed on the floor, but before he would lie down, he said he had occasion to go to the door. Mr. B. awakened Mr. Watson, who got up to attend him to the door. Smith said to him that if I had any apprehensions, he had better tie a rope to his arm, which he accordingly did, fastening it above the handcuffs with the other end wound round his own hand. In this situation, they went out of doors, but in an unguarded moment, Smith, watching his opportunity, knocked him down with his handcuffs, leaving the rope in the hands of his keeper, having slipped the other end over his hand without untying the knot. Thus, handcuffed and pinioned and bound with a rope, the ingenious horse dealer, by another effort of his unfailing ingenuity, akin to his mock sickness in the jail, had effected a second escape from his keepers, leaving it as a matter of choice whether to institute a hopeless search for him in darkness of the night or sit down in sullen consultation on what plan they had best pursue in the morning. Nothing could exceed the chagrin of Putnam and Watson in finding themselves robbed of their prisoner, except the confusion which filled myself and the jailer on the knowledge of his unexampled and noted escape from the jail. To pursue him in the night, which was unusually dark and rain of besides, was both hopeless and vain. It was therefore thought best to inform the sheriff in the morning of what had taken place, and receive his advice as to future proceedings. In the morning, accordingly, Mr. Putnam proceeded to Kingston, and on communicating the news to the sheriff, received a supply of money, with orders to pursue the road to St. John, while the sheriff, with two men, proceeded to Mr. Bales. There they received information that Smith had changed his course, and crossing the Oknabok Lake in the night, was directing his course towards Fredericton again. It will be remembered that previous to his escape, while a prisoner at Mr. Bale's, he made particular inquiries whether there were any ferries on the way to St. John, on this side the river. At this time, it would seem that he had looked upon his scheme as successful, and evidently directed those inquiries concerning the road with a view to mislead, while it was his policy to return upon the course which would be judged the most unlikely of all he should take. But to return to our story. 
He came to the lake the same evening he had got clear of Mr. Watson and the rope, and there urged as a reason of his haste in crossing the lake in the night that he was on his way to Fredericton to purchase land, and that he had arranged it with Putnam and Watson, who had gone to Kingston with the thief, to take him up in their canoe on their return, and was to meet them at the intervale above early the next morning. This well-varnished and characteristic story procured him a speedy passage over the lake, and now our adventurer is in undisputed possession of the country, at liberty to choose which way he should turn his face. On being put in possession of these particulars, we immediately and naturally supposed that he was wisely and prudently directing the scores to the United States, by the way of the Aramakto, and so he followed up his retreat accordingly. But in that direction no intelligence could be obtained and we remain in total ignorance of his proceedings and history up to the 26th of October. At this date, when it was supposed that he had transported himself into the United States, to our astonishment and surprise, we find him again in the prosecution of his usual business in the immediate vicinity of Fredericton. His first appearance there again was in a by-place, at a small house not then occupied as a dwelling. It was drawing towards night, and the day having been rainy, he came to the house wet and cold. An old man by the name of Wicks with his son was engaged in repairing the house in which they had some potatoes. There was also a quantity of dry wood in the house, but as the old man was about quitting work for the day, he had suffered the fire to burn down. The stranger was anxious to lodge in their humble habitation for the night, but the old man observed to him that they did not lodge there at night and gave him an invitation to the next house where he could accommodate him better. He did not accept the invitation, but said that he must go on eight or ten miles that night, and so he departed. The old man and his son secured a door and retired to their lodgings, but when the morning came, it was found that Smith had returned to the old house, spent the night, burned up all the wood, regaled himself and roasted potatoes, and again took his departure. The following night, he paid a sweeping visit at the house of Mr. Wilmot, seven miles from Fredericton. Finding a large quantity of linen, sprinkled and ready for ironing, he made a full seizure of the whole, together with a new coat belonging to a young man belonging to the house. The plunderer, finding his booty rather burdensome, took a saddle and bridle, which he happened to discover, put them on a small black pony, which was feeding in the pasture, and thus rode with his luggage till he came within two miles of Fredericton. There he found a barrack or hovel, filled with hay, belonging to Jack Patterson, a mulatto, which presented a convenient retreat where he could feed his horse and conceal his plunder. Here he remained some days undisturbed, would turn his horse out to feed on the common in the day, concealing himself in the hay, and would catch him at night, ride into town, make what plunder he could, return to his retreat, and conceal it in the hay. Our adventurer thought it was now high time to pay his respects to the attorney general himself, who lived about three miles distant. Here he was not altogether unacquainted, having made a previous call on his passage as a prisoner from Woodstock to Fredericton. He arrived on the spot about nine o'clock in the evening, retaining, no doubt, an accurate remembrance of the entrance to the house, and everything proved propitious to the object of his visit, for it happened that there was much company at the Attorney General's on the same evening, whose overcoats, cloaks, tippets, comforters, etc., etc., were all suspended in the hall. He did not obtrude himself upon the notice of the company, but paid his respects to their loose garments, making one sweep of the hole consisting of five top coats, three plaid cloaks, a number of tippets, comforters, and other wearing articles. Having been more successful than perhaps he expected, he rode back through the town to the place of concealment, deposited his booty, and gave his horse, after his travel, a generous allowance of hay. This generosity to his horse led to his detection, for Patterson happening to perceive that his hay was lying in an unusual manner out of the window of his barrack immediately formed an opinion that some person had taken up lodgings in the hay, and in this he was not mistaken, for on coming to the spot, he found Smith lying in the hay, with a white comforter about his neck. On perceiving him to be a stranger, he asked him where he did he come from, and was answered that he came from the Kennebecasses, was after land, and getting belated had taken up his lodging in the hay, and hoped it was no harm. 
After Patterson had gone into his house, he perceived that the traveler had retired from the barrack by the window and was making towards the woods. Upon perceiving this, the idea of his being a deserter instantly presented himself to his mind and calling for assistance. He soon made the stranger a prisoner, which was easily effected, as he did not make much effort to escape. It was soon discovered that their prisoner was no less a person than the far-famed Henry Moore Smith, and no time was lost in committing him to Fredericton Jail. Patterson, not seeing the comforter with him which he wore around his neck in the hay, was induced to examine the hay if perhaps he might find it. This led to the discovery of his entire deposit, for he not only found the immediate object of his search, but also all the articles previously mentioned, with many more, which were all restored to the owners respectively. Upon the examination of the prisoner, he gave no proper satisfaction concerning the articles found in the hay. He said they were brought there by a soldier who rode a little pony and went off, leaving the saddle and bridle. He was then ordered to be taken by the sheriff of York County and safely delivered to the sheriff of King's County in his prison. Accordingly, the sheriff prepared for his safe conveyance an iron collar made of a flat bar of iron, an inch and a half wide, with a hinge and clasp fastened with a padlock. To the collar, which was put around his neck, was fastened an iron chain, ten feet in length, thus prepared and his hands bound together with a pair of strong handcuffs. After examining his person lest he should have saws, or other instruments concealed about him, he was put on board a sloop for his old residence in Kingston. They started with a fair wind, and with Patterson, the mulatto, holding the chain by the end, they arrived with their prisoner at Kingston, a distance of sixty miles, about twelve o'clock on the night of the 30th of October, which was better than one month from the time of his triumphant escape through means of his pretended indisposition. On his reappearing in the old spot and among those who administered so feelingly to his comfort during the whole period of his affected illness, and whom he had so effectually hoaxed, it might have been expected that he would have betrayed some feeling or emotion, or that a transient blush of shame at least would have passed over his countenance. But, ah, uh, no. His countenance had long since become seared, and there was no sensibility within, strong enough to give the slightest tint to his shame-proof countenance. He appeared perfectly composed and as indifferent and insensible to all around him as though he were a statue of marble. On the ensuing morning, he was conducted to the jail, which he entered without hesitation or seeming regret. After his former escape, it had been cleared out of everything and carefully swept and searched. In the course of the search, there were found several broken parts of a watch, and among the rest, the box which contained the mainspring. This convinced us that the watch, which he received from the young man before his escape, in exchange for the spyglass, was intended to furnish him the materials for making a saw in case all other plans he might adopt to accomplish his release should fail to succeed. We found a large thinner knife cut in two, which we suppose to have been done with a saw made of the mainspring as a trial or experiment of its utility. End of chapter 4 Chapter number 5 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates, Chapter 5 Chained to the floor of his dungeon, he contrived to cut the chain and had also sawn the bars of the grated window. Makes a second attempt at escape, breaks chains, padlocks, and handcuffs, and an iron collar about his neck, tries suicide by hanging. Having by this time, from painful experience, become a little acquainted with the depth of his genius, we thought it not impossible nor unlikely that he might still have the saw concealed about his person, although Mr. Burton, the sheriff of York County, had searched him before his removal from Fredericton Jail. We were, however, determined to examine him more closely, from which end we took off his handcuffs and ordered him to take off his clothes. Without hesitation or reluctance, he divested himself of his clothes, all to his shirt. We then searched every part of his dress, the sleeves, wristbands, collar of his shirt, and even to the hair of his head, but found nothing. We then suffered him to put on his clothes again, and we carried out of the jail his hat and shoes and every article he brought with him. The prison in which he was confined was 22 feet by 16, stone and lime walls 3 feet thick on the sides, the fourth side having been the partition wall between the prison rooms. This partition was of timber, 12 inches thick, lathed and plastered. 
The door was of two-inch plank, doubled and lined with sheet iron, with three iron bar hinges three inches wide, clasped over staples in the opposite posts, and secured with three strong padlocks, and having also a small iron wicket door secured with a padlock. There was one window through the stone wall, grates within and without, and enclosed with glass on the outside, so that no communication could be had with the interior undiscovered. The passage that leads to the prison door is twenty feet in length and three feet in breadth, secured at the entrance by a padlock on the door. The outside door was also kept locked so that no communication could be had through the passage without passing through three securely locked doors, the keys of which were always kept by Mr. Dibble, the jailer, who from his infirm state of health never left the house day or night. Having learned a lesson by former experience, we maintained the most unbending strictness, suffering no intercourse with the prisoner whatsoever. In this manner secured, we put on his right leg an iron chain no more than long enough to allow him to reach the necessary and take his provision at the wicked door. The end of the chain was fastened to the timber of the floor by a strong staple near the partition wall so that he could not reach the grated window by five or six feet. He was provided with a bunk, straw, and blankets as a bed, and his wrists having been much swelled with the handcuffs, I considered it unnecessary to keep them on, especially as he was so thoroughly secured in other respects. In this situation I left him, with directions to the jailer to look to him frequently through the wicket door, to see that he remained secure, intending at the same time to visit him occasionally myself. The jailer came to look at him frequently at the wicket door, as directed, and always found him quiet and peaceable, either sitting up reading or lying down in his berth. He never uttered any complaints, but appeared resigned to his confinement. I visited him once or twice in the week to see for myself that his irons remained secure, and always finding him as yet in the same state of security in which I had left him, I made up my mind that we should be able to keep him without any additional trouble. He manifested good nature as well as resignation, for he always came to the wicked door when I wished to see that his irons were in order with the greatest seeming willingness. On the twelfth day of his confinement, I was informed that Mr. Newman Perkins had heard an unusual noise in the night, which induced him to think that Smith had been at work at the grates. On making a more particular inquiry, I learned from Mrs. Perkins that she had heard a noise like rubbing or filing late in the night, and by holding her head out the window, she considered the sound to proceed from the jail. Knowing the situation of the prisoner, chained, that he could not reach the grate by five or six feet, and knowing also that after the search we had made, it was impossible that he could have retained about his person anything by which he could operate on the grates, we judged it more than improbable that the sound could have proceeded from him. Nevertheless, we did not treat the information with disregard or neglect. I went immediately to the prison, accompanied by Moses Foster, George Raymond, Alan Baston, and Mr. Dibble the jailer, with several others. It was then the evening, and we carried with us two or three candles. On opening the door, we found him lying in his berth, chained just as I had left him. I said to him, Smith, you have not got out yet. He answered, no, not quite. I then examined every bar of the grates as closely as possible, as also did every one present again and again, until we were all satisfied that the cause of the alarm was only imaginary. Smith, all the time lying quiet, answering readily any and every question that was put to him. Mr. Baston had yet continued searching and examining the inner grates, when it was discovered by all present that there was a small chip lying on the flat bar of the outer grate, which was supposed to have been there accidentally. Mr. Baston, however, being fully satisfied that the inner grate remained secure, was led rather by curiosity to reach through his hand and take up the chip that lay on the bar of the outer grate. On doing this, he thought he could perceive that the bar was inclined to hang in a small degree. This led to further examination and to the utter astonishment of all that were present, it was found that the bar was cut one-third off and artfully concealed with the feather edge of the chip. Our astonishment was increased by the fact that it was impossible to reach the outer grate without first removing the inner. This gave the hint for a more effectual examination when it was found that he had cut one of the inner bars so neatly that he could remove and replace it at pleasure, having contrived to conceal the incisions in such a manner as to almost preclude the possibility of detection. There is little or no doubt that in two or three nights he would have effected his second escape, had not his works been discovered through the very means which, artful as he was, he employed to conceal them. 
On being asked what instrument he used in cutting the grate, he answered with perfect indifference, with this saw and file, and without hesitation handed me from his berth a case knife, steel blade, neat and cut and fine teeth, and a common hand saw file. I then asked him how he got to the grates, or whether he had slipped the shackles off his feet. He answered me no, but that he had cut the chain in the joint of the links, a part where the cut could not very readily be discovered. On being asked where he got his tools, he answered that he left them in the jail when he went away, and that those he had given me were all the tools he had left. But perceiving from the shape of the knife, it having been much thicker on the back than the edge, that the bars could never have been cut so neatly through with that instrument, we were inducted to make a stricter search, and found in a broken part of the lime wall near the grates a very neat spring saw, having a cord tied at one end. I then asked him who gave him these tools, to which he replied with great firmness, You need not ask me again, for I will never tell you. After I had finished with these inquiries, I searched his bed and his clothes, and renewed the chain again to his leg, fastening it firmly to the floor with a staple, and putting on a pair of strong handcuffs of seven-eight bolts. We then left him, it being about eleven o'clock on a Saturday night. On the next Sunday at four o'clock, I revisited the jail, when the jailer informed me that the prisoner was lying in his berth with all his irons on, and had been inquiring of him if the sheriff was not coming to examine his chains. About twelve o'clock the same night, I was alarmed by a man sent by the jailer to inform me that Smith had got loose from his irons, and having worked his way through the inner grate, was cutting the outer grate, and had nearly escaped. Here at the dead hour of midnight, when it might be expected that every eye would be sunk in the stillness of sleep through the vigilant attention of Mr. Dibble the jailer, this astonishing being, who set handcuffs and shackles and chains at defiance, had all but effected another escape. Mr. Dibble, on finding him to be at work at the grates, was determined, if possible, to take him in the act, and by fastening a candle to the end of a stick three feet in length and shoving the light through the wicket grate, he was enabled to discover him at work before he could have time to retreat to his berth. Mr. Dibble, on perceiving how he was employed, ordered him to leave everything he had and to take to his berth. He instantly obeyed, but as suddenly returned to the grates again and placed himself in a position to which he could not be seen by the jailer. Remaining here but a moment, he went quickly to the necessary and threw something down which was distinctly heard and finally retired to his berth. Mr. Dibble maintained a close watch until I arrived at the jail, which we immediately entered and to our amazement found him extricated from all his irons. He had cut his way through the inner grate and had all his clothes collected, with him ready to elope, and had cut the bar of the outer grate two-thirds off, which no doubt he would have completed long before morning, and made his escape. I said to him, Smith, you keep at work yet. He answered that he had done work now, that all his tools were down the necessary. The truth of this, however, we proved by letting down a candle, by which we could clearly see the bottom, but no tools were to be seen there. His return to the necessary and dropping, or pretending to drop something down, was no doubt an artifice by which he attempted to divert our attention from the real spot where his tools were concealed. But in this also, with all his cunning, he overshot the mark by his over-eagerness to tell us where he had cast his tools, instead of allowing us rather to draw the conclusion ourselves, from his return to the place and dropping something down. We next proceeded to strip off and examine his clothing, carefully searching every hem and seam. His berth we knocked all to pieces, examining every joint and split. We swept out and searched every part of the prison, knowing that he must have his instruments in some part of it, but all to no purpose. Nothing could be discovered. We replaced all his chains and padlocks, put on him a pair of screw handcuffs which confined his hands close together, and thus left him about four o'clock on Monday morning. On the day following, Mr. Jarvis, the blacksmith, having repaired the grates, came to put them in, when he found Smith lying on the floor apparently as we left him. But on examining the new handcuffs which screwed his hands close together when put on, we found them separated in such a manner that he could put them off and on when he pleased. On being asked why he destroyed those valuable handcuffs, because, said he, they are so stiff that nobody can wear them. No doubt then remained that he must have his saws concealed about his body, and having been ordered to take off his clothes, he complied with the usual readiness. On taking off his shirt, which had not been done at any previous time in our searches about his body, Dr. A. Paddock, who was present and employed in the search, discovered a small muslin cord about his thigh, close to his body, and drawn so close that it could not be felt by the hand passing over it with the shirt between. 
This small cord was found to conceal on the inside of his thigh a fine steel saw plate, two inches broad and ten inches long, the teeth neatly cut on both the edges, no doubt of his own work. After this discovery, we put on him light handcuffs, secured his chains with the padlocks again, and set four men to watch him the whole night. The next day, we secured the inner grate, filing with the squares with brick, lime, and sand, leaving a space at the upper corner of only four by five inches, in which was inserted a pane of glass in the center of the wall. This small opening in a wall three feet thick admitted little or no light, so that the room was rendered almost a dungeon, which prevented the prisoner from being seen at any time from the door without the light of a candle. From this time, we never entered the prison without candles and two or three men. On the 13th of November, I addressed a letter to Judge Chitman, to which I received the following answer. St. John, November 14th, 1814. Dear Sir, I received your letter of yesterday relating the new attempts of H.M. Smith to escape. I have forwarded the same to Frederiction, and presume that a court will be ordered for his trial, as soon as may be practicable, for the state of traveling and the necessity of procuring the witness from Nova Scotia, though I should suppose not before the ice makes. In the meantime, the most utmost vigilance and precaution must be made of use to secure him. You will be justified in any measures of severity that you may find it necessary to adopt for this purpose. I am to your sir, faithfully yours, Walter Bates, Esquire Ward Chipman. Wednesday the 16th, we entered the prison and found that he had been employed in breaking the plaster off the partition wall with his chains, and broken one of the padlocks and appeared to have been loose. Seemed very vicious, and said he would burn and destroy the building, would make it smoke before he left it, and that we would see it smoke. I then prepared a pair of steel fetters, case-hardened, about ten inches long, which we put on his legs, with a chain from the middle seven feet long, which we stapled to the floor. We also put an iron collar about his neck, with a chain about eight feet long, stapled also to the floor in a direction opposite to the other, and also a chain from his fetters to the neck collar, with handcuffs bolted to the middle of his chain in such a manner as to prevent his hands from reaching his head and feet when standing, leaving it just possible for him to feed himself when sitting. All these irons and chains he received without discovering the least concern or regard. When the blacksmith had finished riveting the hole, I said to him, Now, Smith, I would advise you to be quiet after this, or if you are not, you will next have an iron band put round your body and stapled fast down to the floor. He very calmly replied, Old man, if you are not satisfied, you may put it on now. I do not regard it. If you will let me have my hands loose, you may put on as much iron as you please. I care not for your iron. In this situation we left him, loaded with irons, the entire weight of which was forty-six pounds, and without anything to sit or lie upon but the naked floor. Although he was thus situated in an entire dungeon, he appeared not in the least humbled, but became more troublesome and noisy, and exceedingly vicious against the jailer. Despair and madness now seemed to seize him, and raving and roaring would unite with the utterance of prayers and portions of the scriptures. With a tremendous voice he would cry out, O oh, you cruel devils, you murderers, you manslayers, you tormentors of man! How I burn to be revenged! Help, help, help me! Lord, help me to be revenged of those devils! Help me that I might tear up this place, that I might turn it upside down, that there may not be one stick or stone of it left. My hair shall not be shorn, nor my nails cut, till I grow as strong as Samson, then I will be revenged of all my enemies." Help, help, O oh Lord, help me to destroy these tormentors, murderers of man, tormenting me in chains and darkness, shouting, Darkness, darkness, O oh darkness, not light to read the word of God, not one word of comfort from any. All is, you rogue, you thief, you villain, you deserve to be hanged, no pity, not one word of consolation, all darkness, all trouble, singing, Trouble, 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 O oh God, help me, and have mercy upon me, I fear there is no mercy for me. Yes, there is mercy, it is in Jesus, whose arms stand open to receive, but how I dare look at him whom I have offended. He then would call upon his parents and deprecate his wicked life, then rave again, murderers, tormentors, consider you have souls to save, consider you have souls to lose as well as I, a poor prisoner, consider you have children that may be brought to trouble as well as I, consider I have parents as well as they. Oh, if my parents knew my situation, it would kill them. My wife be gone from my sight. Why will you torment me? It is for you that I suffer all my sorrow. It is for you my heart bleeds. 
Not a friend comes to see me, nothing before me but pain and sorrow, chains and darkness, misery and death. O oh, wretched me, how long am I to suffer in this place of torment? Am I to linger a life of pain and sorrow and chains and misery? No, I will cut the thread of life and be relieved from this place of darkness and trouble, singing trouble, trouble, trouble a thousand times repeated. In this manner he continued raving till he became very hoarse and exhausted, would take no notice of anything that was said to him, and finally left off speaking entirely. The weather having become very cold, he was allowed his berth again with a comfortable bed of straw and blankets. But the blankets had to be taken away from him again on account of his having attempted to hang himself with one of them made into a rope. He attempted to starve himself, but this he gave over after having fasted three or four days. He now dropped into a state of quietness and lay in his bed most of the time, day as well as night, but on the 16th of December we found on examining his prison that he had broken the iron collar from his neck and drawn the staple from the timber, but replaced it again so as to prevent detection. On the 17th we put a chain about his neck and stapled it to the floor in such a manner that he could not reach either of the stables. In this situation he remained secure and rather more quiet, yet with occasional shouting and screaming until the 15th of January. The weather having now become very cold, and no fire allowed him, fears were entertained that he might freeze. To prevent which it became necessary to remove his irons, with the exception of his fetters and handcuffs, were accordingly taken off. For this relief, Smith showed no sign of thankfulness, but became more noisy and troublesome, especially in the night, disturbing all within the reach of his voice, with screeching and howling, and all manner of hideous noises, entirely unlike the human voice, and tremendously loud, even beyond conception. In this manner he continued for five months, occasionally committing violence upon himself and breaking his chains, during which period he could never be surprised into the utterance of one single word or articulate sound, and took no notice of any person or thing, or of what was said to him, no more than if he had been a dumb, senseless animal. Yet performing many curious and astonishing actions, as will be related hereafter. In the New Testament, which he always kept by him, a leaf was observed to be turned down, under which, upon examination, was found the following scripture in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you, etc. The weather having been intensely cold throughout the month of January, and he having no fire, great fears were entertained that he must perish from cold, but astonishing to relate his hands and feet were always found to be warm, and even his chains. In February, when the weather began to moderate a little, he became more troublesome, began to tear off the lime wall and lathing from the partition and break everything he could reach. A strong iron-hooped bucket that contained his drink he broke all to pieces. The hoops he broke up into pieces not exceeding three inches long, and he would throw the pieces with such dexterity, though handcuffed, as to put out the candle when the jailer would bring the light to the wicket door to examine what he was doing. As the weather moderated, he became more noisy and vicious, as will appear by the following letter which I received from the jailer on February 10th. Dear Sir, there must be something done with Smith. He is determined to let me know what he is if no one else does. He sleeps in the daytime, and when I go to tell him to keep still at night, he yells so as to not hear what I say to him. Instead of thanks for taking off his irons, he makes up all the noises he can by yelling and screaming all night, and knocking very loud all night with some of part of his irons. I wish you would come up early and advise what is best to be done. W. Dibble When I come to the jail accordingly, and found his irons uninjured, and to prevent him from using his hands so freely, locked a chain from his fetters to his handcuffs, and left him. On Sunday, two gentlemen from Nova Scotia, at the request of Smith's wife, came to make enquiry after him. I went with them to the jail to see if he would speak or take any notice of them, or of what they would say to him from his wife. They told him that his wife wished to know if he would have her come to see him, and what she would do with the colt he left, that she would sell it for two hundred dollars and have the money sent to him, but all they said had no effect on him, any more than if he had been a lifeless statue which convinced us that he would go to the gallows without speaking a word or changing his countenance. The next week he became more restless and vicious, and on Sunday, on going to the jail with Mr. Rulofson from Hampton and Mr. Griffith from Woodstock, found he had broken up part of his berth and broken his chain from the handcuffs, leaving one link to the staple, the parted links concealed, tore up part of his bedding and stopped the funnel of the necessary. It appeared also that he had been at the grates, but how he got there was a mystery, for the chain by which his legs were bound was unbroken, 
and the staple fast in the timber. We then raised the staple and again put on the chain to his handcuffs, fastening the staple in another place more out of his reach. The next day I found he had again broken the chain from his handcuffs and torn a large portion of lathing and plastering from the middle wall. Finding this, I determined to confine him more closely than ever, and so put a chain from his feet round his neck, stapled to the floor, securing the handcuffs to the middle of the chain. He had already given such mysterious and astonishing proofs of his strength and invention that I feared he would finally baffle all my ingenuity to prevent his escape. The twisting of the iron collar from his neck and drawing the staple from the timber was a feat that filled everyone with wonder. The collar was made of a flat bar of iron, an inch and a half wide with the edges rounded. This he twisted as if it were a piece of leather, and broke it into two parts, which no man of common strength could have done with one end of the bar fastened in a smith's vice. The broken collar was kept a long time, and shown to many a wanderer. As might be expected, his wrists were frequently much swelled and very sore from his exertion to break and get loose from his irons yet he appeared as insensible and as regardless of his situation as if he had in a reality been a furious maniac. Notwithstanding the seeming insanity which characterized these works of his in the prison, yet other parts of his performance there indicated the most astonishing genius and invention, perhaps in a manner and degree unequaled in the memory of man. On the 1st of March, on entering his prison in the evening, we found him walking in front of an effigy or likeness of his wife, which he had made and placed before him against the wall as large as life. When the light was thrown upon the scene, which he had prepared and got up in the dark, it not only filled us with amazement, but drew out all the sensibilities of the heart with the magic of a tragedy, not so much imaginary as real. This effigy he intended to represent his wife, visiting his wretched abode and manifesting signs of disconsolation, anguish, and despair, on beholding her wretched husband moving before her in chains and fetters, with dejected mien and misery and despair depicted in his countenance. The effigy was formed out of his bedding and the clothes and shirt he tore off his body, together with a trough three or four feet in length, which was used in the jail to contain water for his drink. Rough as the materials were, yet he displayed such ingenuity in its formation and conducted the scene in a manner so affecting that the effect it produced when viewed with the light of the candles was really astonishing, and had a kind of magical power in drawing out the sympathies of everyone who witnessed it. He continued noisy and troublesome till the 5th of March, when we took off his irons and caused him to wash himself and comb his hair, which had not been cut since he was put in jail. Neither had his beard been shaved. On receiving a piece of soap for washing, he ate a part and used the rest. We then gave him a clean shirt, which he put on himself with the rest of his clothing, after which we replaced his irons, which he received in the same manner as an ox would his yoke or a horse his harness. End of chapter number five. Chapter 6 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andrew Wade. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates. Chapter 6. Second trial ordered. Smith continues to break chains and relieved himself of fetters riveted on by a blacksmith. Reads Bible and makes straw figures. Feigns insanity when placed on trial. Refused to plead. Found guilty and sentenced to death. The term of the court of common pleas was now coming on, which required much of my attention for necessary preparations, and Mr. Dibble, the jailer, being about to remove to Sussex Vale to take charge of the academy there, my situation began to look rather awkward and unpleasant. Accordingly, the jailer moved away on the 11th of March after sitting on the court, and from the extraordinary trouble which the prisoner was known to have given, I had little hope of finding anyone who would be willing to take the charge. However, I prevailed with Mr. James Reed, a man whom I could confide, to undertake the charge of him who, with his family, moved into the house the day following. After this, Smith appeared more cheerful, and became rather more quiet until the 24th of March, when I was called on by the jailer, who informed me that Smith was attempting to break through the partition where the stovepipe passed through the debtor's room. On entering the jail, we found him loose of all his irons. His neck chain was broken into three pieces, the chain from his neck to his feet into three pieces, the screw handcuffs, 
into four pieces, and all hanging on nails on the partition. His great coat was torn into two parts, through the back and then rent into small strips, one of which he used as a belt, and supported with it a wooden sword, which he had formed out of a lathe, and which he amused himself by going through the sword exercise, which he appeared to understand very well. The chains from his legs were disengaged from the staples and tied together with the strip of the torn coat. His hand, his feet, and his clothes were all bloody, and his whole appearance presented that of an infuriated madman. There were present on this occasion Messrs. Daniel Michu, Moses Foster, George Raymond, Walker Tisdale, the jailer, and some others. I then raised the staple, secured him by the leg chain, put on a pair of stiff handcuffs, and added a chain to his neck, stapled to the floor. In this situation, we left him until the 28th, when I was called again by the jailer, who said he believed he was loose again and about some mischief. On on entering the jail, I accordingly found him loose, the chain from his neck in three parts. He had beaten the lime off the wall with a piece of his chain three feet long, and we left him for the purpose of getting his chains repaired. At night, we added a new chain from his fetters to his neck and stapled him to the floor with a chain about four feet long. We secured his handcuffs to the chain between his neck and feet so that when standing, he could not reach in any direction. In this situation, he remained until the 31st, spending his time in singing and hallowing occasionally. I was then again called by the jailer, who, on opening the wicked door, found a piece of chain hanging on the inside. I immediately went to the jail and found that he had separated all his chains, had tied his feet chained to the staple again, and was lying in his bed unconcerned, as if nothing had happened, having a piece of chain about his neck. We then took his bunk bedstead from him and removed everything out of his reach. No link in his chains appeared to be twisted, nor were there any broken links to be seen. From this we inferred that he still must have some means of cutting his chains. At this moment, however, it occurred to us that he might have broken his links concealed in the privy. We accordingly let down a candle by which we could see the bottom, and with an iron hook prepared for this purpose, we brought up a bunch of broken links which he had tied up in a piece of his shirt, together with a piece of his neck chain a foot long. This convinced us that he had not destroyed his chains by means of cutting them, but by the application of some unknown mysterious power. I then determined to break the enchantment. If strength of the chain would do it, and added to his fetters a large timber chain, which had been used as the bunk chain of a bobsled, by which four Four or five logs were usually hauled to the mill at once. The chains had previously used were the size between that of a common ox chain and a large horse trace chain. Secured in this manner, we left him, and on the 6th of April we found his neck chain parted again. I then replaced it with a strong ox chain about seven feet long, firmly stapled to the floor. The next morning the jailer informed me that from the uncommon noise he made in the night, he was convinced he must be loose from some of his irons or chains. I then concluded that he must have broken the steel fetters. As I judged it impossible for human strength or invention in his situation to break either of the ox chains, but to my utter astonishment I found the ox chain parted and tied to a string to the staple, his handcuffs, fetters, and log chain having remained uninjured. We fastened the ox chain to his neck again by driving the staple into another link. After this he remained more quiet, his wrist having been much galled and swelled by his irons, and bruised and rendered sore by its exertions to free himself from there. At this time I received a letter from the clerk of the circuit, of which the following is a copy. St. John, March 15th. Dear Sir, at length I enclose the precept for summoning a court of warrior and terminer and jail delivery in your county on Thursday, the 20th of April, for the trial of the horse stealer. I also enclose a letter from Major King for his saddle stolen from him at the same time. Yours, Ward Chipman. To Walter Bates, Esquire, High Sheriff. After this, our prisoner remained some time rather more peaceable, and amused himself with braiding straw, which he did in a curious manner, and I made a kind of straw basket which he hung on the partition to contain his bread. Sometimes he would make the likeness of a man, and sometimes that of a woman, and place them in posture singularly striking, discovering much curious ingenuity. At this he would amuse himself in the day, but spent the night in shouting and hallowing and beating the floor with his chains. On entering the jail we discovered the image or likeness of a woman, intended to represent his wife. He had placed it in a sitting posture, 
at the head of his bed, with the New Testament open before her, as though reading to him, while he sat in the attitude of hearing with serious attention. I was induced to look into the New Testament, and found it open to the twelfth chapter of St. Luke, and the leaf turned down at the fifty-eighth verse, which read as follows, When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence to thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. It would seem as though he had intended to represent her as reproaching him for his escape from the constables on his way to Kingston while he would defend his conduct by referring to the above portion of scripture he produced many other likenesses which he would place in different significant postures manifesting the most remarkable ingenuity and invention a special court for his trial had been summoned to meet at kingston on the twentieth of april but it was postponed until the fourth of may on account of ice having remained unusually late in the river as will appear by the following letter st john fifth april eighteen fifteen dear sir i have received your letter detailing the very extraordinary conduct of the culprit in your custody there is certainly a mystery in this man's means and character which is unfathomable i fear there will be considerable difficulty with him on the trial your vigilance and exertions of course cannot be relaxed as the best thing to be done i dispatched your letter without delay to the attorney-general that they might adopt at headquarters any such measures as they think expedient for the further safeguard and security of the prisoner very respectably yours to w bates esq w chipman sunday sixteenth april eighteen fifteen dear sir i have just received by express from fredericton a letter from the attorney-general stating that from the state of the river it will be impractical for him to be at kingston by the twentieth and as he has to hither then to taken the whole burthen of the trial upon himself it cannot go on without him from the circumstances therefore and as the present state of travelling would probably render it dangerous to my father's health who is not now very well to hold the court this week as he is determined to put it off till thursday the fourth of may for which day he wishes to summon your jury and to proclaim the holding of the court he regrets much giving you this additional trouble but it must be attributed to the extraordinary backwardsness of the season which was not probably foreseen when it was recommended to hold the court on the twentieth of april i have not time to forward a new precept by this conveyance but i will forward one in time or the one you have may be altered this can be easily arranged when we go up to the court yours truly w bates esq w chipman the court accordingly proclaimed and at the same time i wrote a letter enclosing the proclamation to mr dibble the former jailer to which i received the following answer dear sir i yesterday received your letter enclosing your proclamation of the circuit court for the trial of smith the horse stealer i shall be very sorry if judge chipman's health should be such as to prevent the, his attending the trial should the attorney-general attempt to prosecute on recognizance for the escape i think his the judge's influence at the court would prevent it i am quite of your opinion that it will be the most difficult case that has been before any court for trial in this county as for his behaving much better after i left the jail it was what i expected he would do to put reed off his guard those parts of his chains that were hanging in the inconvenient situations were powerful weapons and had reed come into the jail alone or weak handed he would have felt the weight of them it is remarkable that the villain with all his art and cunning should manage it so ill and it seems altogether providential that from the beginning except for his sickness he has either delayed too long or been too hasty which has prevented his escape before and i hope and trust will be the same with you i am sorry for your trouble you have with him and confident confidently hope and trust he will not evade your vigilance you are too well acquainted with his conduct to need advice i must claim from you the particulars of his conduct at the trial i remain yours truly w bates esq w dibble on the thirtieth of april i went to the jail and found smith lying quietly with all his irons and chains uninjured and told him that on thursday next the fourth of may he must have his trial before the court for his life or death and that mr pearson the deputy sheriff who apprehended him at picked to would come to witness against him but he paid no attention to what i said the second day mr pearson came to see him and told him that his smith's wife had come to see him but he took no notice of him no more than he could neither see nor hear and set all defiance all attempts to exhort one single expression as though he were destitute of every sense 
On the third day, we found that he had been at the stone wall, his face bruised and bloodied. I renewed my attempts to elicit something from him by telling him that the next day he would be brought before the court for his trial. But all was in vain. He gave me the most decided indications of confirmed insanity, patted his hands, hallowed, sang without articulating, and continued to sing and beat the floor with his chains the most of the night. The 4th of May, the day appointed for his trial, being now come, the court began to assemble in the early morning, and numerous spectators crowded from every part of the county. About eleven o'clock his honor Judge Saunders and the Attorney General arrived from Fredericton. About one o'clock the whole court moved in procession to the courthouse, which was unusually crowded with spectators. After the opening of the court in the usual form, the prisoner was called to the bar. The jailer and four constables brought him and placed him in the criminal's box. He made no resistance, nor took any notice of the court, and, as usual, acted the fool or the madman. Snapping his fingers and patting his hands, he hemmed and hawed and took off his shoes and socks and tore his shirt. Every eye was fixed on him with wonder and astonishment. The attorney general read his indictment. The judge asked how he pleaded to that indictment, guilty or not guilty. He stood heedless and silent, without regarding what was said to him. The judge then remonstrated with him and warned him that if he stood mute out of obstinacy, his trial would go on and he would be deprived of the opportunity of putting himself on his country for his defense, and that sentence would be given against him. He therefore advised him to plead not guilty. He still continued mute and acting the fool without betraying the slightest emotion. The judge then directed Smith to impanel a jury of twelve men to inquire whether the prisoner at the bar stood mute willfully or obstinately, or by the visitation of God. From the evidence brought before the jury on this inquiry, it appeared that he had been in the same state for three months preceding, during which time he could not be surprised into the utterance of one word. The jury consequently returned the verdict from the prisoner stood mute by the visitation of God. The judge then directed the attorney general to enter the plea of not guilty, and the counsel from the prisoner was admitted. The court then adjourned till ten o'clock the next morning. The next morning, Friday, the court assembled accordingly, and the prisoner was again brought to the bar, and placed in the the criminal's box as before. He sat down quietly, maintained his usual silence and inattention. The most profound silence reigned in the court, which was still crowded with spectators, and every eye was fixed on the prisoner with the most eager attention. The judge then arose and observed that the prisoner appeared more calm this morning and directed the attorney general to proceed with the trial. After the jury had been impaneled and taken their seats and the witnesses brought before the court, the prisoner was ordered to stand for his defense, hold up his hand, and hear the evidence. But he still maintained the same disregard and indifference, giving no attention to anything that was said to him. The constables were then directed to hold up his hand, but to this he offered the most determined resistance, and fought and struggled so furiously that they were unable to manage him. They then procured a cord and pinioned his arms, but this was no avail. He would flounce and clear himself from them all, as though he had the strength of some furious animal. They then procured a rope and lashed his arms back to the railings of the box. But he still continued his struggling and reached the railings before him would break them like a pipe stem. They then procured another rope and bound his hands together and secured them to the railings in the opposite direction. Finding himself overpowered in his hands, he immediately availed himself of his feet, with which he kicked almost less lily and soon demolished all the railing in the front of the box, notwithstanding all the efforts of the constables to prevent him. Another rope was then procured, and his feet bound in a way from the post from the box, so that he was rendered incapable of further mischief. After securing him in this manner, all the constables, being in readiness for his movements, while he himself sat as unconcerned as though nothing had happened, the attorney general proceeded to read his indictment, in which the prisoner stood charged with having feloniously stolen a certain bay horse, the property of Frederick Willis Knox, Esquire, of the value of thirty-five pounds. Mr. Knox, having been sworn, stated the matter of his pursuit after the prisoner, with all the circumstances, until he came to Truro, as he had already been detailed. At Truro, he engaged Mr. Pearson, deputy sheriff, to pursue on to pick two, whither he was informed the prisoner had gone to sell the horse. Mr. Peters, counsel for the prisoner, on the cross-examination of Mr. Knox, asked him how he wrote his Christian name. Willis or Wills? He answered, I am christened and named after my godfather, Lord North, the Earl of Willsboro, and I never write my name Willis. Mr. Peters then produced authorities to show where one letter omitted or inserted in a man's name had quashed an indictment and moved that the prisoner be discharged from this indictment. The move was overruled by the judge, but was reserved for a question in the court above. 
The witness Pearson, having been sworn, deposed and said that he pursued after the prisoner the whole night and early the next morning was shown the prisoner and arrested him on suspicion of having stolen the horse and told him that the owner of the horse would soon be present. He seemed but little surprised and only replied that he came honestly by the horse. The witness further stated that he had asked the prisoner where the horse was, who unhesitatingly pointed to the house where he soon found him. The witness went on to state that he took the prisoner before the judge justice for examination, and thence to the jail at Pictou, that he then went to the house which the prisoner pointed out to him, and there he found the horse, that he returned homewards with the horse about ten miles, and met Mr. Knox, who immediately knew the horse, and called him by his name Bretagne, and they returned to Pictou, where the prisoner remained in jail, on examination, and was found to have in his possession a watch, about fifteen guineas in money, with a number of watch seals and other articles, some of which appeared he had stolen on his way as he escaped with the horse, that he was committed to the charge of a constable and Mr. Knox to be conveyed by warrant from Nova Scotia to the jail at Kings County in New Brunswick, that before he was taken from the jail at Pictou, he had cut the bolt from his handcuffs nearly through and had artfully concealed it, which was fortunately discovered and new handcuffs provided. Otherwise, he most certainly have escaped from his keepers before he arrived at Kingston. The circumstances against the prisoner were that he gave contradictory statements as to the way which he came by the horse, at one time asserting that he bought him from a peddler, at another from a Frenchman, again that he swapped for him, and at Amherst produced a receipt for money paid in exchange. The counsel for the prisoner, in cross-examining, asked Mr. Knox, Did you ever see the prisoner in possession of the horse? No, but he acknowledged it. Did you ever hear him acknowledge that he was in possession of the horse in any other way than by saying he came honestly by him? No. Mr. Pearson was cross-examined in the same manner and answered in the same effect. Mr. Peters, in defense of the prisoner, produced authorities to show that by the evidence of the prisoner was not taken in the manner as stated in the declaration, and that it was sufficient for him to prove, in a general way, how he came in possession of the horse, which he was able to do by receipt he produced for the money paid in exchange. The best general evidence that can be given, such as the common way of dealing in horses, he acknowledged that if the prisoner had been taken on the back of the horse, he would then have been taken in the manner stated by the Attorney General, and consequently bound to prove how he came in possession. But in the present case, he himself, or anyone present, might have been in this unfortunate prisoner's situation, dragged to the prison, to the court, and to the gallows, because he could not produce the person who actually sold him the horse. The prosecutor had not produced any evidence of the horse ever having been in possession of the prisoner, or any other way other than by his own confession, and he trusted that the jury would not hesitate to find the prisoner was not taken in the manner as stated in the declaration, but he would pronounce him, by their verdict, not guilty. The judge, in his charge to the jury, overruled the plea by stating to the jury that his having been taken in the manner was proved by the various accounts he gave of his getting the possession of the horse, thus rendering himself liable to prove how he came by him, or to stand guilty of having feloniously taken him, as stated in the indictment, that they had heard the witnesses, and if the evidence and circumstances before them, they would have found him guilty, but if they had any doubts, that leaning to mercy, they would find him not guilty. While the jury was out, the sheriff invited the court and other gentlemen to visit jail, where they were shown the irons and chains and the situation in which the prisoner had been placed. The jury, after an absence of about two hours, returned with a verdict of guilty. The judge then proceeded to pass upon him the awful sentence of the law, death without benefit of clergy. But the criminal remained unmoved and unaffected, and continued shouting and hallowing. The court asked the counsel for the prisoner whether he had anything to offer in arrest of judgment, or why the sentence of death should not be executed upon him. Mr. Peters then arose and produced authorities to show that the present law that took away the benefit of clergy for horse-stealing was not in force in this colony, and that it would not be construed to be in force, and must be a question to be decided in the higher court, where he hoped to have the honor of discussing it. The judge admitted the plea, but gave his opinion against him. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andrew Wade.
Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger, by Walter Bates. Chapter 7 After sentence, Smith assumes indifference to his fate, breaks fastenings again, his marionette family described by Sheriff Bates, tells something of his past history, his case considered by Supreme Court at Fredericton. The business being ended, the prisoner was returned to his cell, where he received his chains with willingness and apparent satisfaction. The court adjourned without delay. The Attorney General, however, gave me to understand that the prisoner would not be executed immediately, and requested that I observe his behavior, and inform him by letter the particulars of his conduct. The next morning I visited him, and observed to him that he was now under the sentence of death, and he would be allowed only one pound of bread every day with water, during the short time he had left to live, that as soon as the death warrant was signed by the President, he would be executed, and that a short time only was left to him to prepare for the dreadful event. But he paid no attention, patted his hand, sang, and acted a fool as usual. One of the visitors, being much surprised at his insensibility, observed to him, Smith, it is too late for you to deceive any more. Your fate is now fixed, and you had better employ your little time in making peace with God than to act the fool any longer. On our next visit to the jail, which was soon after, we found his testament open, and a leaf turned down to the following passage. If any man among you seemeth to be wise, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. From this it would appear that he either found it as pretended insanity on scripture precept, or affected to do so. Yet it cannot be supposed that he intended us to know what use he made of the scripture, as he must have known that our conclusion would be that he was more rogue than fool. I kept him nine days on bread and water during which time he manifested no sign of hunger, more than when we fed him four times his allowance, and tore off every particle of his clothing, leaving himself entirely naked. After this time, I allowed him other provisions, and his subsequent behavior was briefly stated in a letter to the Attorney General, and afterwards published by the Royal Gazette. The following is a true copy of the letter, as it appeared in that paper, July 11th, 1815. A copy from the High Sheriff of Kings County, Kingston, June 26th, 1815. My dear sir, having heard nothing from you since the late jail delivery at King's County, I beg leave to state you some circumstances of the criminal Henry Moore Smith since his trial and sentence. After securing him with some strong chains to his neck and legs, and with handcuffs, he continued beating the floor, howling day and night with little intermission, making different sounds, sometimes with jingling his chains, and sometimes without, apparently in different parts of the jail, insomuch that the jailer frequently sent for me, supposing he must be loose from his chains, which I conceived and frequently observed was impossible, being far from beyond the power of human strength or invention in his situation. But on the 24th of May, going into the jail early in the morning, after examining his chains at two o'clock the day before, I found three links of his heaviest chain separated and lying on the floor, being part of the chain without the staple. He continued in the same way until the 2nd of June, when we found the largest chain parted about the middle and tied with a string, which clearly proves that irons and chains were no security for him. I then put on a light chain, which he has been ever since. I never discovered him at work at anything, but he frequently produced effigies or likenesses, very striking representing his wife. He now produced an effigy of a man in perfect shape, with his features painted, and joints to all his limbs, and dressed him in clothes that he had made in good shape and fashion, out of clothes he had torn off himself, being now naked, which was admired for its ingenuity. This he would put sometimes in one position and sometimes in another, and seemed to amuse himself with it, without taking the least notice of anything else, continuing in his old way howling without any alteration until the 13th, when the jailer informed me that he refused to eat, and no doubt was sick. I went to see him every day, found he did not eat all the bread and other provisions visions conveyed to him he gave to his effigy, strung on a string and put in his hands. He lay perfectly still day and night and took no notice of anything, would drink tea or milk, which I gave him twice a day for five days. He then refused to drink anything for two days, which made seven days that he ate nothing. In that time he began to speak, would ask questions, but would hold no conversation. But the most extraordinary, the most wonderful and mysterious of all, is that in this time he has prepared undiscovered, and at once exhibited the most striking picture of genius, art, taste, and invention that ever was, and I presume ever will be produced by any human being placed in his situation, in a dark room, chained and handcuffed, 
under the sentence of death, without so much as a nail of any kind to work with but his hands, and naked. The exhibition is far from beyond my power to describe. To give you some faint idea, permit me to say that it consists of ten characters, men, women, and children, all made and painted in the most expressive manner, with all the limbs and joints of the human frame, each performing different parts. Their features, shape, and form all express their different offices and character, their dresses of different fashions, and suitable to the situations which they are. To view them in their stations, they appear to be perfect as though alive, with all the air and gaiety of actors on the stage. Smith sits in his bed by the side of the jail. His exhibition begins about a foot from the door, and encompasses the whole space to the ceiling. The uppermost is a man whom calls his tambourine player, or sometimes Dr. Blunt, standing with all the pride and appearance of a master musician, his left hand a kimbo, and his right hand his tambourine, dressed in a suitable uniform. Next to him below is a lady genteely dressed, gracefully sitting in a handsome swing. At her left stands a man neatly dressed, in the character of a servant, holding the side of the swing with his right, his left hand on his hip, in an easy posture, waiting the lady's motion. On her right hand stands a man genteely dressed, in the character of a gallant, in a graceful posture for dancing. Beneath these three figures sits a young man and a young woman, apparently about fourteen in a posture of tilting at each end of the board, decently dressed. Directly under these stands one whom he calls Bonaparte, or sometimes the father of his family. He stands erect. His features are prominent, his cheeks red, his teeth are white and set in order, his gums and lips red, his nose shaded black, representing the nostrils. His dress is that of a harlequin. In one hand he holds an infant, in the other he plays or beats music. Before him stand two children, apparently three or four years old, holding each other by the hand in an act of playing or dancing, which, with a man dressed in fashion, who appears in the character of a steward, sometimes in one situation and sometimes in another, makes up the show all of which you have in one view. Then commences the performance. The first operation is from the tambourine player, or master, who gives two or three single strokes on his tambourine that may be heard in any part of the house without moving his body. He then dances gracefully a few steps without touching his tambourine. The lady is then swung two or three times by the steward. Then the gallant takes a few steps. Then the two below tilt a few times in the most easy, pleasant manner. Then the two children dance a little, holding each other by the hand. After this, Smith begins to sing, or whistle a tune, to which they are to dance, at which the tambourine strikes, and everyone dances to the tune, with motion, ease, and and exactness, not to be described. Many have been the observations of spectators. Among them, an old German observed, when he was starving the seven days, he was making a league with the devil that he helped him. All acknowledged with me that it exceeds anything they ever saw or imagined. His whole conduct from the first has been, and is, one continued scene of mystery. He has never shown any idea or knowledge of his trial or present situation. He seems happy. His irons and chains are no apparent inconvenience, contented like a dog or monkey broke to his chain, shows no more idea of anything past than if he had no recollection. He, in short, is a mysterious character, possessing the art of invention beyond common capacity. I am almost ashamed to forward you so long a letter on the subject and so unintelligible. I think if I could have done justice in describing the exhibition, it would have been worthy a place in the Royal Gazette, and better worth the attention of the public than all the waxwork ever exhibited in this province. I am, with all respect, dear sir, your humble servant, Walter Bates, to Thomas Wetmore, Esquire, Attorney General. P.S. Wednesday, the 28th. This morning I found he added to his works a drummer, placed at the left of his tambourine player, equal in appearance and exceedingly in performance, beats the drum with either hand or both occasionally, in concert with the tambourine, keeping time with perfect exactness, sometimes sitting at others standing or dancing. He had also, in the most striking manner, changed the position of his scene. The lady above, described to be sitting so gracefully in her swing with so many attendants and admirers, is now represented sitting in a dejected posture, with a young infant in her arms. Her gallant has left her, and is taking the young girl before described about fourteen by the hand with an air of great gallantry, leading her and dancing to the tune with perfect exactness, representing more than can be described. On viewing this, an old Scotchman observed, Some say he is mad, others he is a fool, but I say he is the sharpest man I ever saw. 
His performance exceeds all that I have ever met with, and I do not believe he was ever equaled by man. This evening, a gentleman from Boston, having heard the above description, came to see the performance, and declared he could say, as the Queen of Sheba did, that the half had not been told. To this, the editor of the Gazette adds the following remarks. We have been given an entire copy of the above letter, which has excited our astonishment, and will, probably, that of every person who has not seen the exhibition and performance described in it. Those who are acquainted with the sheriff know him to be incapable of stating falsehoods or attempting in any way to practice a deception, and will, of course, give credit to the statement of facts, wonderful as they may appear to be which he has made. The Supreme Court in July being about to be held in Fredericton, and feeling anxious to know the fate of the prisoner, I attended for this purpose, and having ascertained from the Attorney General that his destiny would not be fatal, I returned again to Kingston, when the jailer informed me that his first night I had left Kingston, Smith had drawn the staple from the chain that was about his neck, and had so concealed them both in a way that could not be found, and the glass in the brick wall was broken at the same time, but that the chain could not have gone through that way, as the outside glass in the window was whole, that the room and every other part of the jail had been thoroughly searched, but neither the chain nor staple could be found, neither could it be imagined how he broke the glass, as it was far beyond the reach of his chains. On my entering the jail, Smith said to me, the devil told my drummer, if I did not put that chain out of the way, you would certainly put it around my neck again, that he hated it and had murdered it and put it under the dirt, but he feared that he should have no peace till he raised it again. I then told him he must raise it again, and if he behaved himself well, I would not put it about his neck again. The next morning, the chain was seen lying on the jail floor, but where or by what means he concealed it could never be found out. I then took off his handcuffs and gave him water to wash himself. I also gave him a clean shirt and jacket, and a young man who was present gave him a black handkerchief, which he put about his neck and seemed much pleased, and said that if he had a fiddle or any instrument of music, he could play it for his family to dance, and if he had a set of bagpipes, he could play on them very well, and that if we gave him a wood and leather, he would make a set. He was offered a fife, which he handled in a clumsy way, but he said he believed he could learn to play on it. He paid the boy for it, and then took the fife, and would play any tune either right or left-handed. I then told him if he would behave well, I would not put his handcuffs on that day. He replied that he would, and then have his family in good order for my ball. But he observed that when he put one hand to anything, the other hand would follow as though the handcuffs were on. We gave him some materials that he wanted, and then left him. This was the 17th of July. On the 18th, we found him busily employed with his family, making improvements for the ball. I gave him pen, ink, and paint, and many articles for clothes etc. And all his figures were formed of straw from his bedding, curiously entwined and interwoven. The coloring he had used before was his own blood and coal, which he had got a piece from the burnt timber in the jail. And their first clothing was made from his own torn clothes. He now began to talk more coherently, and accounted for the broken glass. He said to me, my drummer cried out for more air. His family stood so thick about him. Well, I said, tell me how to get more air, and I will go to work at it. He told me to make a strong wisp of straw, long enough to reach the glass and break it, which I did. And then, after undoing the wisp, put the straw in my bed again. He continued improving his family by dressing and painting them all anew, and by adding to their number. He said there was a gentleman and a lady coming from France to attend his ball, and all of them must perform well. With the money he had received from the visitors, many of whom I had known to give him a dollar for one exhibition, he purchased calico enough from a curtain or screen. In front of the partition stood all of his family, which he continued to improve and increase, until he said that they were all present and coming to the ball, and about the 10th of August completed his show for exhibition. The whole consisted of 24 characters, male and female, six of which beat music in concert with the fiddle, while 16 danced to the Tune. The other two were pugilist, Bonaparte with his sword fighting an Irishman with his shillelagh. His musicians were dressed in their proper uniform. Some were drummers, some were tambourine players, and some were bell ringers. In the center stood his dancing master with his hat, boots, and gloves on, and in advanced station stood an old soldier in Scotch uniform, acting as a sentinel, while Smith himself stood before them, his feet under the curtain playing a tune on the fiddle to which they would all dance or beat in perfect harmony with the music. The one half of the right 
to the one part of the tune, the other half on the left to the other part, and then all together, as regular and natural as life. The dancing master with his right hand and foot with one part, and his left hand and foot with the other, and then the whole together, with the utmost ease to say any tune was played. So ingenious, and that I may say, so wonderful was the exhibition, that it was impossible to do justice to its description. And the numbers of persons from different parts came to indulge their curiosity by witnessing the performance, and all expressed their astonishment in terms of the most unqualified. Dr. Pryor, a gentleman from Pennsylvania, was among the number of visitors. He told me he had spent most of his time in foreign parts traveling for general and literary information, and that he had made it a point to examine all curiosities, both natural and artificial. And having heard much of the extraordinary person I had in prison, he came for the express purpose of seeing him in his exhibition. Having viewed his person and every part of his performance, he was pleased to say that he had traveled through all the continent of America and a great part of Europe, but had never met anything the equal of what he there saw performed, and that he certainly should not fail to insert a notice of it in the journal of his travels and observations. Another gentleman, Dr. Cooklin, from Ireland, who had been a surgeon in His Majesty's service both by land and sea, came also to visit our prisoner, and to see his extraordinary exhibition, and after having viewed it occasionally for several days, he remained at Kingston, declared that he had lived in England, Ireland, and Scotland, and had been in France and Holland, and through a great part of Europe, had been at Hamburg and other places famous for numerous exhibitions of various kinds, but had never met with any that all respects equaled what he saw there exhibited. The doctor then belonging to the garrison at St. Andrews, having heard, while at headquarters from the attorney general an account of this extraordinary character took his tour from fredericton by way of kingston for the express purpose of satisfying his curiosity and seeing for himself when on entering the prison smith seeing the doctor in regimental said to him with much good humor i suppose you are come here looking for deserters there is my old drummer i don't know but he deserted from some regiment the rest are my family he seemed very much pleased with his new visitor and readily exhibited every part of his performance to the full satisfaction of the doctor who expressed his astonishment in the most unqualified terms and acknowledged that it far exceeded his anticipations august thirteenth at evening we found that we had improvised his scottish sentinel by giving him a carved wooden head finished with natural feathers of a bold highlander this was the first of his carved work he had also much improved his pugilist bonaparte by some unlucky stroke had killed the irishman and had taken off his head and hung it up at his right hand a brawny old scotchman had taken taken the Irishman's place and was giving the Corsican a hard time of it, knocking him down as often as he got up. The next day at noon, I called to see him. He had been fiddling remarkably well and singing very merrily, but on my entering I found him busily employed at carving a head which was to take Bonaparte's place, for that bold Scotchman would overpower him soon. He observed that carving was a trade in England, and that he did not expect to do so well at it before he made the trial, and further remarked that a man did not know what he could do until he was set about it, and that he had never failed in anything he undertook. He said he had never seen such a show in England as that he was now working at, that he had only only dreamed of his family and had the impression that he must go to work to make them all that if he did it would be better with him and if he did not it would be bad with him that he had worked ever since by night and by day and had not quite completed them yet that there were a shoemaker and a tailor that had not yet come for want of room that he should make room if he did not go away that he had been here until he had become perfectly contented and contentment he said was the brightest jewel in his life and that he never enjoyed himself better than he did at present with his family. In the evening I went to see him again, and, as my curiosity to know the origin of so singular a character was greatly excited, I hoped that the present would have proven a favorable opportunity to draw some information from him. But he cautiously and studiously avoided answering any questions relative to his previous life, and affected not to understand what I said to him. Sometimes he would talk very freely, and in a prophetic strain of his future destiny. He said he knew he was going away from home, and that he should find enemies. Everyone who knew him would be afraid of him and look upon him with distrust and horror, that occasionally he was distressed in his sleep with all kinds of creatures coming about him, great hogs and all kinds of cattle and creeping things, snakes and adders, frogs and toads, and every hateful thing, that he would start up from sleep and walk about the prison, then lie down and get sleep and be annoyed with them again, that he would sit up and talk to his family and sometimes take his fiddle and play to amuse himself and drive away these dreary hours of night, 
He said these snakes and adders he could read very well, that he knew what they all meant, and could understand something concerning the others, but that these frogs and toads coming together he could not understand, only that he knew he was to leave this place and go on the water, and that he could see as clearly as he saw me standing before him, that he should find enemies, and everyone would be afraid of him, but he would hurt no one. He should find trouble and have irons on him, but that they should come off again, that the crickets came and would get upon his children and would sing among them, that he liked to hear them, that his mother told him he must not hurt them, that they were harmless and that he must not hurt anybody. His mother, he continued to say, always gave him good advice, but he had done that which he ought not to have done and had suffered for it, but he forgave all his enemies. The Lord says, if you ask forgiveness of him, forgive thy brother also. We cannot expect forgiveness except we repent and forgive our enemies. The word of God is plain. Except you forgive your brother his trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you when you ask of him. All men are sinners before God. Watch, therefore, and pray that ye enter not into temptation. I watch here and pray with my family night and day. They cannot pray for themselves, but I shall not stay long. He could not go to see a supercargo for some vessel, or he could get his living with his family as a show in any country but England, and that he had never seen such a show in England, that he had never enjoyed himself better than with his family at present. He did not care for himself so as long as his family looked well. He would be willing to die, and that he should like to die here rather than to go among his enemies. But he believed he had one friend in England, Old Willie. If he is yet alive, he was always his friend, and he should like to go and see him and that he had one sister, he said, in England, that he wanted to see. She played well on the pianoforte, and he himself could play on it also. She was married to a lieutenant in the army, but he was promoted to be captain now. If he could, he would go see her in England, where he had friends. He also said he had an uncle in Liverpool, a merchant. Then looking earnestly upon me, he said, My name is not Smith. My name is Henry J. Moon. I was educated in Cambridge College in England. I understand English, French, and Latin well, and I can speak and write five different languages. He also said that he could write any hand as handsome or as bad as I ever saw. He said that he had 500 pounds in the Bank of England, which was in the care of Mr. Turner, and that he wished to have his wife get it, as he did not know where he should go. But he knew he should meet with trouble, yet he did not fear what man could do to him, for he could but kill him and he should like to die here. And after hearkening to these incoherent observations for a length of time, without being able to obtain any answer to any question I put to him, I left him for that time. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Yvette Ducham. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger. By Walter Bates. Chapter 8. Smith becomes a fortune teller and startles the jailer. Foretells his own release. Pardoned by the court, he refuses to leave the jail, which he sets on fire in a mysterious way. Finally shipped on a schooner to Nova Scotia with his marionettes. The next morning, when the jailer went in to see him, Smith said he had been fishing and had caught a large fish. The jailer, on looking, perceived the chain which Smith had formerly worn about his neck and had been missing a long time, but never could find out where or by what means he concealed it. After this, he commenced a new scene of mystery, that of fortune-telling, in which, if he did not possess the power of divination, he was wonderfully successful. The jailer carried him his breakfast, with tea. Smith observed to him that he could tell him anything, past or to come. The jailer then asked him to tell him something that had happened to him. Smith replied, Some time ago you rode a great way on my account, and carried letters and papers about me, and about others too. Again you went after a man, and you had to go on the water before you found him, and I am not sure that you found him on the water. While you were after him, you saw a man at work in the mud on the highway, and you inquired of him for the man you wanted. He told you what you asked. You then asked him if there was any water near that you could drink. He told you of a place where he had drank. You went to it but found the water so bad you did not drink it. The jailer was greatly astonished at this, knowing the whole affair to be true just as he had stated, and had no recollection of ever having mentioned the circumstance to any person. 
Perhaps all this may be attempted to be explained away in some manner, or may be attributed merely to his imagination or the hazard of an opinion, but it would be a coincidence not to be expected and very unlikely to happen. Besides, he often hit upon a development of facts which could not be accounted for, but upon the supposition of some mysterious knowledge of things beyond the reach of common conception, as the following particulars will fully testify. The next morning, August 13, he told me his own fortune out of his teacup. After looking into the cup for some time, he kissed it and told the jailer he was going away from this place, that he was going over the water and must have a box to put his family in, that he saw three papers that were written and sent about him, and that one of them was larger than the other two and contained something for him that he did not understand, but he would soon know. The next morning, August 14th, he looked in his cup again and told the jailer that these papers were on their way coming and would be here this day at four o'clock, and he would soon know what they contained about him. Accordingly, I received papers from Fredericton, containing his pardon, and two letters, just as he had predicted. In addition to this, the following must be regarded as a very singular and remarkable prediction, which, independently of some unknown mysterious means, cannot be accounted for. Early in the morning he remarked to the jailer in his usual manner, This man over the way has a son who has gone to sea, and is at sea now, but he will be here this night, and you shall see that I will affront him. Now mark the sequel. It so happened that a fresh breeze springing up to the southward, with a strong flood tide, the vessel which contained the young man was alongside in the dock in St. John, on the same day about two o'clock. He was then and there informed that one of his sisters lay dangerously ill at Kingston, and that Dr. Smith was just going up to visit her. The young man hired a horse, and in company with the doctor, arrived at his father's about the time that we usually visited the prisoner in the evening. I called at Mr. Perkins and found that the doctor and young Perkins had just arrived. The doctor said to me that he had heard much of my extraordinary prisoner, and if I had no objection, he should be much pleased to see him and his show. He had heard so much of his great performance. Young Mr. Perkins said he would also like to see the show, and all went with me into the jail and found Smith lying on his bed, but without appearing to take notice of anyone present. Mr. Perkins, like everyone else, was much astonished at the appearance of his show, as it was exhibited on the wall, and had a great desire to see the performance. He put down a quarter dollar by Smith and said he would give it to him if he would make his puppets dance, but Smith would not take any notice of him, and young Perkins continued to urge him to the performance, but without effect, until now he was quite out of patience, and finally took up his money, which he had proposed giving for the exhibition, and left the jail in quite an ill humour. After Perkins left the jail, Smith said, Now, if any of you want to see my family dance, you may see them in welcome, and took up his fiddle and went through the performance to the entire satisfaction of all present. Now, the reader may account for this mysterious prediction and its fulfilment upon whatever grounds he pleases, but the arrival of the young man from sea that day, his coming to Kingston, and his being affronted by Smith in the jail are facts which cannot be disputed. The writer is aware that he may incur the imputation of weakness for narrating some things relative to the prisoner, but as they are all characteristic of him in a high degree, and when all united set him forth before the world as a character singular and unprecedented, he considered that every part of his sayings and doings had their interest and were necessary to be narrated. After closing the exhibition of his family for this time, he went on to say that he had told his fortune from his teacup, and it came always alike, that he could tell a great deal by dreams. The devil helped fortune-telling, he said, but dreams were the inspiration of God. When the hogs came to him by night, he could tell a great deal by them. Your neighbour, he said to me, had a black sow that had pigs, some black, some all white, and one with red dots before and behind. By them, he said he could tell much. I was aware that Mr. Perkins had a sow with young pigs, and I had the curiosity to look at them, but they did not answer to his description, and I consequently allowed these remarks of his relative to the sow and pigs to pass for nothing. However, in the evening, as I was leaving the jail, Smith said to me, 
and without a word having been said about my looking at the pigs. The pigs I told you about are not those you examined. They were six months old. I made no reply, knowing that Mr. Scoville had a sow with pigs, answering to his description in every particular. On Saturday morning, Smith said to the jailer, Your neighbour over the way there has a sow that has gone away into the woods, and she has pups, some all black, some all white, and some black and white, and she will come home before night, and when she comes, she will have but one pig, and that will be a plump black pig, and they will never know what became of the others. Accordingly, the sow, about four o'clock, came home with her one plump black pig and was immediately driven back into the woods the way by which she appeared to have come. But according to the precise terms of Smith's prediction, the others were never found. The next evening, after I had received his pardon from Fredericton, I went to see him, and found him in bed, but he said he could not eat, asked for some new potatoes, and remarked that the jailer's wife had new potatoes yesterday, and did not appear in his usual good humour. Although he would both talk and act at times rationally, yet he had never recovered from his pretended insanity, nor even until his release from my custody, thus carrying out his scheme in perfect wisdom to the last. But now, with a pardon in my hand, I hope to make some impression upon him, and, if possible, bring him to some sense of his situation, by compassionately proposing my assistance to get him out of the province. I then proceeded to inform him that I had received his pardon, that his attorney had proved his friend, and had petitioned the President and Court, stating that he was a young man, and this having been the first instance of a case for horse-stealing before the Court in this province, prayed that mercy might be extended and his life spared, and that President and Council had been graciously pleased to withdraw the sentence and grant his pardon, and that I was now authorised to release him on his entering into recognizance to appear in the Supreme Court and plead his pardon when called upon. The only reply made was, I wish you would bring me some new potatoes when you come again. I proceeded to say that as soon as he was ready and would let me know where he wished to go, I would give him clothing and would give him time to put his family in order, and a box to put them up in, observing that they might be a means of getting him a living until he could find better employment without being driven to the necessity of stealing. He replied, Have you not got boys and girls that wish to see my family dance? Bring all your family to see them. I will show them as much as you please, but others must pay. I remained with him nearly an hour afterwards, without saying any more on the subject of his pardon, during which time he continued to talk incoherently as he had done the evening before. That we must watch and pray lest we enter into temptation, that he prayed with his family, they could not pray for themselves, that we must be spiritually minded, for to be spiritually minded was life, but to be carnally minded was death, and much more of this kind, repeating large portions from the New Testament, nearly whole chapters. He observed, Now you see I can read as well to you without the book as others can with the book. I can read you almost all of any other chapter in the Bible you will name, either in the Old or New Testament. It makes not much difference, in the dark as well as in the light. My wife is a good little woman. She would get the Bible on Sunday and say to me, Henry, come sit down and hear me read the Bible. But I would laugh and tell her I could read better without the book than she could with it and go out and look after my horse or do anything on Sundays. I have been a bad fellow. When I was in England, I gave all my attention to reading my Bible and became a great Methodist and went to all the Methodist meetings and would pray and exhort amongst them and finally became a preacher and preached in Brighton, Northampton, Southampton and in London and great numbers came to hear me. I was sometimes astonished to see how many followed to hear me preach the scriptures when I knew they were deceived, but I did not follow preaching long in London. He went on to state his reasons for giving up preaching, or rather the reasons that prevented his continuing to preach. He had given himself up to the company of lewd women and had contracted the disease common to such associations. A course like this could not remain long concealed, and the issue was that he was prevented from preaching and was eventually obliged to leave England and come to this country. He went on to say, I have been a bad young man. I am young now, only 23 years of age, not 24 yet, and did not know but he would preach again. 
he could easily find converts. Many would like to hear him preach. When he was a preacher, he was spiritually minded, and all was peace and heaven to him. But ever since, all was trouble and misery to him. He never intended to leave this place. He was contented and willing to stay here until he died. He was better off here than anywhere else, and never wished to go into the world again unless he was a preacher. After hearing him talk in this manner for some time, I left him till the next day at noon, when I went to the jail again and gave him a good dinner and read his pardon to him. When he saw the paper, he said, That looks like the paper which I dreamed I saw, with two angels and a ship on it, with something that looked like snakes. When I read his pardon, he paid not the least attention to the nature of it, but asked questions as foreign to the nature of the subject as possible. Only he said he wished I would give him that paper. He dreamed it was coming. I told him as soon as I would get him some clothes made, I would give him the paper, and that I would help him away with his show in a box, and that he might not be driven to the necessity of stealing. And in the evening I went with a tailor to take his measure for a coat. When he saw the tailor with his measure, he said, I wish you would give me that ribbon in your hand. It is no ribbon, said the tailor, but a measure to measure you for a new coat. Come, stand up. What? said he. Do you think you are tailor enough to make me a coat? Yes. But you do not look like it. Let me look at your hands and fingers. And upon seeing them, he added, You are no tailor. You look more like blacksmith. You shall never make a coat for me. And would not be measured. But he said he would make it better himself, and wished I would give him a candle to work by, and he would make himself a waistcoat. He said I need not be afraid of his doing any harm with a candle. He would put it in the middle of the floor and take care that his straw and chips did not take fire and burn up his family, which he could not live without, as he could not labour for his living. Besides, he said, if he were so disposed, he could burn up the house without a candle. For, said he, I can make fire in one hour at any time. When I was a boy, continued he, everyone took notice of me as a very forward boy and I obtained a license for shooting when I was but fifteen. One day when shooting, I killed a rabbit on a farmer's land where I had no right. The old farmer came after me, and I told him if he would come near me, I would knock him down. But he caught me and tied me fast to a large stack of faggots, and sent for a constable. While he was gone, I made fire, and burned up the whole stack and got off clear, but the old farmer never knew how the faggots took fire. You do not use faggots in this country. They are little sticks tied up in bundles and sold to boil the tea kettle with, and if I would give him a candle, he would make a fire to light it. Accordingly, I provided materials for his clothes and a lighted candle to work by. He continued to sew by the light of the candle but a short time and put it away from him and said he could see better without it. He completed his waistcoat in the neatest manner and occasionally attended to the improvement of his family. August 29th, at evening, many persons came to see his performance as was usual, and when they were all gone out, he told me that he had carved a new figure of Bonaparte, that the first he had made after his own image and likeness, for he was the man after his own heart, but he had fallen. God, he said, made man out of the dust of the earth, but he had made man out of the wood of the earth. He had now been in my custody more than a year, and almost every day developed some new feature of his character, or produced some fresh efforts of his genius. I had had much trouble with him, and my patience often severely tried, but now I viewed him rather as an object of commiseration, and I could not think of turning him out of the jail naked, destitute and friendless. In such a situation he must starve or steal, so that his pardon and release must become rather a curse than a blessing. I represented these things as feelingly as I could to him, gave him a box to put his family in, and told him he must be ready to leave the province on Tuesday morning, and I would procure him a passage either to Nova Scotia or the United States. To all this he gave no attention, but asked some frivolous questions about mohawks and snakes, and acted the fool, so that I began to conclude that I would now have much more trouble to get him out of jail than I formerly had to keep him in it. 
The next day, Judge Pickett and Judge Michaud attended at the courthouse to take the recognizances required of him to appear and plead his pardon when called upon to do so. After divesting him of his irons and furnishing him with decent clothing, it was with much difficulty I could prevail on him to leave the jail. However, he finally took one of his family in one hand and a pair of scissors in the other, and with much effort we got him up into one of the jury rooms, when Judge Michaud read his pardon to him and explained all the circumstances which united to produce it, to which, as usual, he gave no attention, but looked about the room and talked of something else. Judge Pickett required his recognizance and informed him that if he did not leave the province immediately, he would be taken and tried on two indictments in the county of York. He took no notice of what was said, but talked and danced about the room, told the judge he looked like a tailor, and asked him to give him his shoestring. His pardon lying on the table he caught hold of, and before it could be recovered from him, he clipped off the seal with the scissors. He said he wanted the ship that was on it to carry him away with his family. He tore the collar off his coat and cut it in pieces with the scissors. Finding that nothing else could be done with him, I returned him again into prison, when he said to us that for our using him so kindly, he would, for one shilling, show us all his performance with his family, upon which Judge Michaud gave him half a dollar and told him to return a quarter dollar change, and then he would have more than a shilling. He took it and said it was a nice piece of money and put it in his pocket, but the judge could not make him understand the meaning of change. He then performed the exhibition in fine style, but when we were leaving him he seemed out of humour with Judge Pickett and told him that he had thrown stones at him, that he would burn his house and that this place would be in flames before morning. He could make a fire in half an hour and wanted a fire and would have a fire, and I should see that he could make fire, upon which we left him without apprehending anything from his threats more than usual. But the next day, the 29th, when entering the jail for the purpose of preparing for his removal, I perceived that there was much smoke in the hall, which I supposed had come from the jailer's room, but he said that no smoke had been caused that morning, but that it proceeded from the prison door. I immediately opened the door and found Smith sitting quite unconcerned before a fire, which he had made with the chips of his carved work and other materials. He observed to me that fire was very comfortable, that he had not seen any before for a long time, that he had made the fire with his own hands, and that he could make it again in ten minutes, that he could not do without one. I immediately extinguished the fire and shut him up in the suffocating smoke, which did not seem to give him the least inconvenience. The account of his having made the fire excited the neighbours, who came in to see the feat. I ordered him to put his family into his box immediately. He took no notice of my orders. I hastily took down one of them and laid it in his box, at which he seemed pleased, and said he would put them all in that box, and began to take them down very actively, observing that he did not want assistance from anyone, but leave him with the light and he would have them all ready in half an hour. We left him with the candle, and returning in about an hour found him walking the floor and everything he had packed up in the box very neatly. It was remarkable to see with what skill and ingenuity he had packed them up. I gave him a pair of new shoes, and with the box on his shoulders he marched off to the boat that I had prepared for his conveyance and with three men in the boat we set out with him for the city of St. John. On the way he told the jailer, if he would give him but one dollar, he would teach him the way to make fire on any occasion. Receiving no reply from the jailer, he commenced preaching, praying and singing hymns, and sometimes acting as if crazy during the passage down. We made no stop, by the way, and reached St. John about eight o'clock in the evening. On his perceiving the moon as she made her appearance between two clouds, he observed that here was a relation of his that he was glad to see, that he had not seen one of his name for a long time. On our arrival at the prison in St. John, he said he must have a hot supper with tea, and then wished to be locked up in a strong room, where he might have all his family out to take the air tonight, else they would all die in that box before morning. However, we found all the rooms in the prison occupied or undergoing repairs, so that there was no place to confine him. I directed the jailer to provide him with his supper, while I would call upon the sheriff to know what would be done with him for the night, 
and how he would be disposed of in the morning. I understood from the sheriff that there was no vessel to sail for the States for some days, and therefore made up my mind that I should send him to Nova Scotia. When I returned to the jail, I found Smith at his supper. When he had finished his tea, he looked into his cup and remarked that he must not disturb his family tonight, that he there saw the vessel, then lying at the wharf that would carry him to his wife, and there would be crying. While in confinement, the following letter was received from his wife. Dear Husband, I received your letter of the 22nd October, 1815. You say you have sent several letters. If you have, I have never received them. You wish me to come and see you, which I would have done if I had got the letter in time. But I did not know whether you were in Kingston or not. My dear, do not think hard of me that I do not come to see you. If you write back to me, I shall come immediately. My dear, as soon as you receive this letter, send me an answer that I may know what to do. So no more at present, but that I remain your loving and affectionate wife. H.F.M.S. Kingston Elizabeth P.M.S. The jailer, by direction of the sheriff, cleared out a small room above stairs with an iron-grated window where we confined him with his family for the night. On the next morning, the 30th of August, finding that there was no vessel bound for the States, I determined to send him to Nova Scotia, and happening to meet with my friend, Mr. Daniel Scoville, he informed me that he had a vessel then lying at the wharf, which would sail for Windsor, Nova Scotia, in half an hour. I accordingly prevailed on him to take Smith on board, which was done without loss of time, and at high water the vessel hauled off from the wharf, to my great satisfaction and relief. While the vessel was getting under way, Smith was in the cabin alone, and seeing a great number of chain traces lying on the cabin floor, he took them up and threw them all out of the cabin window. Because, he said, they would get about my neck again. During the passage he appeared very active. He played on his fife and was quite an agreeable passenger. But on the vessel's arrival at Windsor, he left her immediately without any ceremony and notwithstanding the very strong regard which he had always possessed for his family, as he called them, he left them also, and everything else that he had brought with him. He was seen only a very short time in Windsor before he entirely disappeared, and never was known to be there afterwards, but was seen at some distance from Windsor, in several other places, and recognised by many, but always carefully evaded being spoken to. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by walter bates chapter nine did not go to his wife in nova scotia but made a tour committing various depredations is seen in portland maine is heard of at boston and new york and then at new haven where he robbed a hotel arrest and escape recapture and conviction after having made his appearance in different parts of Nova Scotia, he called at a certain house one morning on a by-road, and ordered breakfast, and asked for a towel also, and a piece of soap that he might wash at a small brook that was near the house. The woman of the house, and a maid, were the only persons in the house at the time. Smith left a large bundle which he carried on a chest which was standing in the room and went out to wash. The bundle presented rather a singular appearance, and attracted the young woman's notice, so that she said to the other, "'I wonder what he has in that bundle. If you will keep watch at the window while he is washing at the brook, I will open and see what is in it.' They did so, and found a great number of watches, of which they counted fifteen, with many other valuable articles." She tied up the bundle again, and placed it where he had left it, and said, "'This man has stolen these watches.' 
When he came in, he handed the towel to the young woman and said, "'There were just fifteen watches, were there?' And with such an expression of countenance that she could not refrain from answering, "'Yes.' "'But,' said he, "'you were mistaken about my stealing them, for I came honestly by them.' Upon which the young woman instantly recognized him to be Henry Moore Smith, and concluded that he was collecting his hidden treasure, which he had deposited while he was in Roden. This information I received from Mrs. Beckwith, a respectable lady from Nova Scotia, who resided at the time in that neighborhood, who also said it was not known that he had ever seen his wife at that time, from the time of his release from confinement. The next account I heard of him stated that he had been seen on board of a plaster vessel at Eastport, but he was not known to have been on shore during the time she remained there. He employed himself while on board engraving a number of small articles, some of which he made presents of to young ladies who chanced to come on board. He was next seen at Portland by a gentleman who had known him at Kingston, Nothing, however, transpired there concerning him, only that he was traveling with considerable weight of baggage through the state of Maine, which gave rise to the following ludicrous story, which I saw published at Eastport, of a mysterious stranger traveling in a stage. One cold and stormy night, the bar room of a hotel was filled with sturdy farmers surrounding a cheerful fire and discussing the affairs of state over a mug of flip. The night having been tremendously stormy and wet, the wind whistling all around the house and making every door and window rattle, the landlord expressed much fear for the safety of the stagecoach. But suddenly the sound of a distant stage horn announced the approach of the coach and removed the landlord's anxiety. He replenished the fire that the approaching travelers might have as warm a retreat as possible from the unusual inclemency of the night. Some time passed, and yet the expected coach did not come up. The landlord's fears grew up anew, and with an expression of concern he put the question around, "'Did not some of you hear a horn?' and added, "'I have expected the stage a long time.' and I thought that a few minutes ago I heard the horn near at hand. But I fear that something has happened in the gale that has caused it to be thus belated. "'I thought I heard the stage horn some time ago,' answered the arch-young farmer Hopkins. "'But then you must know that ghosts and witches are very busy on such nights as this, and what kind of pranks they may cut up we cannot tell. You know the old adage, busy as the devil in a gale of wind. Now who knows but they may have... Here he was interrupted by the sudden opening of the door, accompanied by a violent gust of wind and the dashing of rain, when in rushed from the fury of the storm, drenched with wet from head to foot, a tall stranger dressed in a fur cap and shaggy great coat. From an impulse of politeness and respect, not unmingled with fear, all arose on his entrance. The expression, the devil in a gale of wind, rushing upon their minds with a signification to which a profound silence gave expressive utterance. The stranger noticed their reserved yet voluntary respect with a slight nod, and proceeded to disencumber himself of his wet clothes and warm his fingers by the fire. By this time the driver entered, bearing the baggage of his passenger. "'The worst storm I was ever troubled with blowing right in my teeth, and I guess the gentleman there found it the same.' Here a low whisper ensued between the driver and the landlord, from which an unconnected word or phrase dropped upon the ear of the inmates. "'Don't know. Came in the—' as rich as a mine, etc. Upon this information, the landlord immediately took his wet garments and hung them carefully before the fire. I hope that your wetting will not injure your health, sir. 
"'I hardly think it will, my good friend. "'I am no child to catch cold from a duckling.' "'Shall I show you a room, sir?' said the landlord. "'We can let you have as good a room and as comfortable a supper as any in the country.' The stranger was immediately conducted into a handsome parlor, in which blazed a cheerful fire, and in a short time a smoking supper was placed on the board. After supper was over, he called the landlord into his room and sent for his trunk. "'I like your accommodations,' accosting the landlord, "'and if you like my proposals equally, well, I will be your guest for some time, though I know not how long. Nay, I shall stay at any price you please, but remember, I must have my rooms to myself, and they must not be entered without my leave.' and whatever I do, no questions to be asked. Do you consent to these terms? I do, sir, replied the landlord, and you shall not have cause to complain of your treatment. Very well, rejoined the stranger. Then the agreement is completed. You may go now. Yes, sir, replied the landlord. But what may I call your name, sir? "'Beware, you have broken the bargain already,' replied the stranger. "'I forgive you for this once only. Now ask no more questions, or you will certainly drive me from your house.' After this the landlord returned to his bar-room, from which the merry farmers had not yet withdrawn, but were endeavoring to penetrate the mystery that hung around the stranger. "'Well, landlord,' said the arch Hopkins, what do you make him out to be? That is a question I dare hardly answer. He is a gentleman, for he does not grudge his money. I would not think he should, replied Hopkins, shaking his head mysteriously. And why not? exclaimed several of the company. Ah, just as I thought, returned Hopkins, with another shake of the head and significant look at the landlord. "'What in the name of all that's silly is the matter with you, Hopkins?' exclaimed the landlord. "'What on earth can you know?' "'I know what I know,' was his reply. "'Rather doubtful that,' rejoined the landlord. "'You doubt it,' returned Hopkins rather warmly. "'Then I will tell you what I think him to be. "'He is nothing more or less than a pirate.' and you will all be murdered in your beds. Smith, which was the landlord's name, you and your whole family before morning. Now what think you of your guest? All the company stood aghast and stared at each other in silence for some time until the landlord again ventured to interrupt the silence by asking Hopkins, How do you know all that? Hopkins answered in rather a silly manner, I guessed at it, which did away with the effect produced by his previous assertions, and the landlord, dismissing his fears, exclaimed, As long as he pays well, be he man or devil, he shall stay here. A praiseworthy conclusion proceeded from a voice at the back part of the room, and at that instant the mysterious stranger stood before them. All started to their feet, seized their hats, and waited to ask no questions, nor make any additional comments, but went home and told their wives of Smith's guest and Hopkins' opinion of his character. Every woman fastened her door that night with suspicious care, and the mysterious stranger and the delineation of his real character by Hopkins became a subject of general conversation and comment throughout the village and gradually became the received opinion among all the settlers, so that they set down the mysterious stranger for what Hopkins guessed him to be, and concluded that the articles which composed his baggage could not have been obtained honestly. The stranger, finding now the conversation turned upon him, did not think it prudent to protract his stay in this place, and proceeding to Boston in the coach was known from that time by the name of Maitland. He reached Boston about the 1st of November, 
where it was supposed he must have, in some way, disposed of much of his treasures. From thence he proceeded for New York. On the 7th of November arrived at New Haven in the Boston stagecoach, by the way of New London, with a large trunk full of clothing, a small portable desk, and money in his pockets. He was dressed in a handsome frock coat with breeches and a pair of top boots, and remained at the steamboat hotel several days. While he remained there, he always ate his meals alone, and preferred being alone in different parts of the hotel at different times, every part of which he had an opportunity of becoming acquainted with, while he remained waiting for the arrival of the steamer from New York. The hotel was then kept by Mr. Henry Butler, and, as it afterwards appeared, the traveler found his way by means of keys into Mr. Butler's desk and sideboards, as well as every part of the house. He left New Haven in the steamboat at 5 a.m. on the 10th November, 1815. After his departure from New Haven, Mr. Butler's servants discovered that their whole quantity of silver spoons, to the number of four or five dozen, which had been carefully put away in a sideboard, was missing and not to be found on the premises. And it was found, upon further search by Mr. Butler, that a watch and several other articles, with money from the desk, had sympathetically decamped with the spoons. Mr. Butler imagined that the theft must be chargeable on some lodger in the hotel, and immediately fixed his suspicions upon Smith, whose appearance and movements about the house furnished suspicions too strong to pass unnoticed. Mr. Butler, without loss of time, set out for New York, and arriving there before the boat that carried the adventurer, he furnished himself with proper authority and boarded the boat in the stream. After Mr. Butler had made some inquiries of Captain Bunker, who could not identify the traveler among all his passengers, Smith made his appearance from some part of the engine room and was immediately ordered by Mr. Butler to open his trunk with which he complied unhesitatingly. But the trunk did not disclose the expected booty. There was, however, in the trunk a very neat portable writing desk, which he refused to open, and Mr. Butler could not find out how it was fastened. However, he called for an axe to split it open, upon which Smith said, I will show you, and, touching a spring, the lid flew open. The desk contained a set of neat engraving tools with old silver rings and jewelry, amongst which Mr. Butler perceived a small earring which he supposed belonged to a young lady that had slept in his house and laid her earrings on a stand at the head of her bed, which were missing the next morning. After her departure one of the rings was found at the door of the hotel. Upon the evidence of this single earring, he was arrested and put into the Bridewell in the city of New York. The keeper of the Bridewell at that time was Archimiel Allen, an old friend of mine and a man of respectable character. On my visit to New York afterwards, I called on Mr. Allen and inquired the particulars concerning W. H. Newman, for this was the name he had assumed then, while in his custody. He informed me that when he was put in he behaved for some time very well, that he offered him a book, but he could neither read nor write a word. He soon began to complain of being sick from confinement, raised blood, and seemed so ill that a doctor attended him, but could not tell what was the matter with him. However, he kept up the farce of being ill until he was removed from Bridewell to New Haven there to take his trial at the Supreme Court in January. His change of situation had the effect, as it would seem, of restoring his health, which brought along with it that display of his ingenuity which the peculiarity of his new situation seemed to call forth. During the period of his confinement at New Haven, he amused himself by carving two images, one representing himself and the other butler in the attitude of fighting. 
and so mechanically had he adjusted this production of his genius that he would actually cause them to fight and to make the image representing himself knock down that of Butler, to the wonder and amusement of many that came to see him. By his insinuating manner and captivating address, he not only drew forth the sympathies of those who came to visit him, but even gained so far upon their credulity as to induce a belief that he was innocent of the crime with which he was charged. The lapse of a few days, however, made impressions of a different nature. The January court term drew nigh, at which our prisoner was to receive his trial, but on the very eve of his trial, and after the court had been summoned, he, by the power of a mind which seldom failed him in the hour of emergency, contrived and effected his escape in the following curious and singular manner. And here it will be necessary to give some description of the prison, with the situation of the apartments, which the writer was himself, by the politeness of the keeper, permitted to survey. There was a wide hall leading from the front of the county house, and from this hall two separate prisons were entered by their respective doors. Between these doors a timber partition crossed the hall, having in it a door also, to allow an entrance to the inner prison. The object in having this partition was to prevent any intercourse between the two prison doors, and it was so placed as to leave a distance of about two feet on each side between it and the prison doors, respectively. Newman, for this it will be remembered is the name by which our prisoner is now known, was confined in the inner prison. The doors of the prison opened by shoving inwards, and when shut were secured by two strong bolts, which entered into stone posts with clasps lapped over a staple, to which were fixed strong padlocks. These padlocks our prisoner by some means managed to open or remove, so that he could open the door at pleasure and fix the padlocks again in so geniusly that it could not be detected from their appearance. On the night of the 12th January, at the usual time of feeding the prisoners, Newman, availing himself of these adjustments, opened his door, came out, and replacing the locks, took his stand behind the door of the partition, which, when open, would conceal him from observation. The prisoners in the other apartments received their supply first, and the instant when the servant was proceeding from the door to go and bring Newman's supper, he stepped through the partition door, which had been first opened and not shut again, and followed the servant softly through the hall to the front door, and walked away, undiscovered. When the servant returned with his supper to the wicket, she called him, but receiving no answer, placed his supper inside of the wicket, saying, "'You may take it or leave it. I am not going to wait here all night.' She then secured the outer door, and so the matter rested till the morning. The next morning, finding that the prisoner had not taken his supper, the servant observed to the keeper that she feared Newman was dead, for he had not taken his supper, and she called him, but could not hear or see anything of him. Upon this the keeper came with his keys to unlock the door, and to his utter astonishment found both locks broken and the prison empty. The keeper made known the matter to the sheriff, and on the thirteenth, the day subsequent to his escape, the following notice was inserted in the Connecticut Journal. Beware of a villain, one of the most accomplished villains that disgraces our country, broke from the jail in this city on Friday evening last, between the hours of five and six o'clock, and succeeded in making his escape. The fellow calls himself Newman, and was bound over for trial at the sitting of the next Supreme Court on the charge of burglary, having robbed the house of Mr. Butler, of plate, money, etc. He is supposed to be an Englishman, and is undoubtedly a most profound adept in the arts of knavery and deception. He speaks the English and French languages fluently, and can play off the air of a genteel Frenchman with the most imposing gravity. 
He is of middling stature, slender and active, and appears to possess an astonishing variety of genius. He is sick or well, grave or gay, silent or loquacious, and can fence, box, fight, run, sing, dance, play, whistle, or talk as occasion suits. He amused himself while in prison by making and managing a puppet show, which he performed apparently with such means as to excite the wonder of the credulous, having a piece of an old horseshoe wetted on the wall of his dungeon as the only instrument of his mechanism, and complaining only of the scarcity of timber to complete his group. He had the address, by an irresistible flow of good humor and cheerfulness, to make some believe that he was quite an innocent and harmless man, and excited sympathy enough in those who had the curiosity to see him, to obtain several gratifications, which prisoners do not usually enjoy. Yet the depth of his cunning was evinced in accomplishing his means of escape, by which he effected by sawing a hole in the prison door, which is several inches thick, so neatly that the block could be taken out and replaced without any marks of violence. Through this hole he could thrust his arm, and by wrenching off strong padlocks and shoving back the bolts, at the hour of supper, when the person who waited on the prisoners was giving them their food, found a free passage to the hall of the counting-house, and thence to the street. The saw which he used in cutting the door of the prison is supposed to have been one which he stole on board the steamboat Fulton on his passage from New York to New Haven, and so artfully did he conceal the saw, though repeatedly searched both before and after his confinement at the suggestion of Captain Bunker, that he retained it about his person until by its means he effected his escape. About the time that Newman made his elopement, Mr. Butler happened to be in New York, and on his return by land, he met Newman traveling leisurely along a few miles distant from the city. Mr. Butler readily recognized him, and immediately instituted a pursuit, but he baffled his attempt to apprehend him, and made his retreat into the woods. Upon this Mr. Butler engaged a party of men, with dogs and firearms, to ferret him out if possible, but he had vigilance and art sufficient to elude their efforts to take him. The next morning, after the chase, he made his appearance at a certain house, where he found the table placed for the family breakfast, and without invitation or ceremony, sat down at the table and began to eat. While he was eating, he observed to the family that he would not let them take him yesterday, referring to his pursuers. "'Was it you they were after?' inquired some of the family. "'Yes, but I would not let them find me.' "'How came you from New Haven?' was next inquired. "'I stayed a great while,' he replied, "'but they did not find anything against me only that a young woman pretended to say that I had an earring of hers which belonged to my wife, which was not worth waiting for, and so I came away. Here, however, he was apprehended and sent again to Bridewell, but when he came there he denied being the man, and had so altered his appearance and dress that no one knew him until Mr. Allen, the keeper of the prison at New Haven, came and recognized him. He took him in charge at the Bridewell, and returned with him to New Haven in the steamboat. On his arrival at the county house, the sheriff had him closely searched, to see that he had no saws or any other instruments by which he might effect another escape. After the search, he was confined in the criminal's room, handcuffed, with a shackle about one of his legs, to which was attached a long iron chain firmly stapled to the floor, and in company with two negro boys who were confined for stealing. In this situation he was left in the evening, and the next morning, when the keeper came to the door of his prison, he found him walking the room smoking his pipe, with the chain on his shoulder and the handcuffs in his hand, which he presented to the keeper, saying, "'You may take these,' They may be of use to you, for they are of no use to me. 
the keeper, on attempting to open the door, found that he had not only drawn the staple, but had raised the floor also, which was of strong plank firmly fastened to the sleepers with spikes. The heads of some of the spikes were drawn through the planks which he had taken up, and with which he had so barricaded the door that the keeper attempted in vain to enter. Upon this he called upon the sheriff, who came and ordered the prisoner to open the door, to which he replied from within, "'My house is my castle, and none shall enter alive without my leave.' The sheriff then ordered the two colored boys, who stood trembling with fear, to come and remove the fastening from the door, but the prisoner told them that death would be their portion if they attempted it. The sheriff, finding him determined not to open the door, and having attempted in vain to get in by other means, sent for a mason, and ordered him to break an opening through the brick partition which divided the lower room. When the mason commenced operations on the wall, Newman said to the sheriff, "'It is no use to make a hole through the wall, for I could kill every vagabond as fast as they put their heads in. But if the sheriff will bring no one in but gentlemen, I will open the door for him. The door was then opened, and the sheriff went in and secured him, and soon after more strongly with additional irons and chains. Finding himself now overpowered, and another escape rather hopeless, he had recourse to his old scheme of yelling and screaming like anything but the human voice, and seemingly in every part of the house. This he kept up all night, until the whole town was literally alarmed. A special court was therefore immediately called, and in a few days he was brought to his trial. The trial was brought on as a case of burglary, the prisoner having entered a chamber of Mr. Butler's and stole an earring belonging to a young lady then lodging at the house. Newman obtained counsel to plead his case, but not being satisfied with the manner in which the trial was conducted, he pleaded his own case, in which he maintained that the earring did not belong to the lady, but to his own wife, that very like was not the same, and that the evidence before the court did not establish the charge. He was found guilty, however, and sentenced to three years' confinement in the Newgate, Simsbury Mines, which was considered rather a stretch of power on account of his infamous and notorious character. He was consequently sent off next day to the place of his future confinement and labor, ironed and chained, and in a wagon under strong guard. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dan Gerzinski. Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates. Chapter Ten. Seen in the Connecticut prison by Sheriff Bates, he denies that he is Henry Moore Smith. After his release from prison, he robbed a passenger in the Boston coach, visits Upper Canada as a smuggler, turns up as a preacher in the southern states, is arrested in Maryland for theft, possibly finished his career in Toronto. After I arrived in New Haven, where I was put in possession of these particulars concerning him, no person was known in the United States who could identify him to be the noted Henry Moore Smith but myself. I was consequently requested for the gratification of the public to go to Simsbury Mines to see him. I had the curiosity to see how he conducted himself at Newgate, and proceeded to Simsbury about fifty miles for the purpose. On my arrival at Simsbury, I inquired of Captain Washburn, the keeper of the prison, how Newman conducted himself. He answered that he behaved very well, that he heard that he was a very bad fellow, but he had so many that were worse he did not think anything bad in Newman. 
I further inquired of the keeper what account Newman gave of himself, and what he acknowledged to have been his occupation. His answer to these inquiries were that he professed to be a tailor, if anything, but he had not been accustomed to much hard work, as he had always been subject to fits, that his fits were frightful, and that in his agony and distress he would turn round on his head and shoulders like a top and he was so bruised and chafed with his irons in his convulsive agonies that he had taken the shackles off his legs, so that now he had only one on one leg. This was as convincing to me as possible that he was my old friend Smith. The captain asked me if I had a wish to liberate him. I replied, my object was to ascertain whether he were a prisoner I had in my custody more than twelve months, and that if he were, he would know me immediately, but would not profess to know me. Accordingly, when he was brought into my presence in the captain's room, he maintained a perfect indifference, and took no notice of me whatever. I said to him, Newman, what have you been doing that has brought you here? Nothing, said he. I had an earring with me that belonged to my wife, and a young lady claimed it and swore it belonged to her, and I had no friend to speak in favor of me, and they sent me to prison. I then asked him whether he had ever seen me before. He looked earnestly upon me and said, I do not know, but I have seen you at New Haven. There were many men at court. Where did you come from? His reply was, I came from Canada. What countryman are you? A Frenchman, born in France. He had been in London and Liverpool, but never at Brighton. Was you ever at Kingston, New Brunswick? He answered, no, he did not even know where that was. With a countenance as unmoved as if he had spoken in all the confidence of truth. He appeared rather more fleshy than when at Kingston, but still remained the same subtle, mysterious being. I understood that he was the first that had ever effected an exemption from labor in that prison by or on any pretense whatever. He kept himself clean and decent, and among the wretched victims who were daily brought from the horrid pit and chains and fetters to their daily labor of making nails, William Newman appeared quite a distinguished character. So obtuse was he that he could not be taught to make a nail, and yet so ingenious was he that he made a Jew's harp to the greatest perfection without being discovered at work and without its being known until he was playing on it. It was in the city of New Haven that the author published the first edition of these memoirs, being aware that here, where his character and unprecedented actions were perfectly known throughout the country, the publication of his doings at Kingston and his career throughout the provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia would not only be desirable and acceptable, but would also be received with less scrupulousness, when brought, as it were, in contact with facts of a similar nature publicly known and believed. While these papers were being prepared for the press, a gentleman from Washington, Major McDaniel, on his return from Boston, boarded some time in the same house with me, that of Mr. Joseph Nichols, and having heard some details from me of his unprecedented character and actions in New Brunswick, and having also become acquainted with the facts relating to his imprisonment and escape, etc., in that place, could not repress his curiosity in going to see him, and requested me to accompany him at his own expense. He observed that it would be a high gratification to him on his return to Washington, that he would not only have one of my books with him, but would also be able to say that he had personally seen the sheriff from New Brunswick that had written the book, and had seen the remarkable character in the prison of Newgate that had constituted the subject of the book, and also the prison of New Haven from which he escaped. Accordingly, we set out from Newgate, and my friend had the satisfaction of seeing the noted Henry Moore Smith, now William Newman. On our leaving him, I said to him, Now, Smith, if you have anything you wish to communicate to your wife, I will let her know it. He looked at me and said, Sir, are you going to the Jerseys? Why do you think your wife is there? I hope so. I left her there, was his reply, and that with as much firmness and seeming earnestness as if he had never before seen my face. After I had left him and returned to New Haven and 
furnished the printer with this additional sketch and had the memoirs completed, one of the books was shown to him, which he perused with much attention and replied with seeming indifference that there never was such a character in existence, but that some gentleman traveling in the United States had run short of money and had invented that book to defray his expenses. Immediately after he had read the memoirs of his own unparalleled life and actions and pronounced the whole of fiction, as if to outdo anything before recited of him, or attributed to him, he added the following remarkable feat to the list, already so full of his singular and unprecedented actions. In the presence of a number of young persons, and when there was a fine fire burning on the hearth, he affected to be suddenly seized with a violent convulsive fit falling down on the floor and bounding and writhing about, as if in the most agonizing suffering. And what constituted the wonder of this masterpiece of affectation was that in his spasmodic contortions his feet came in contact with the fire and were literally beginning to be roasted without his appearing to feel any pain from the burning. This circumstance confirmed the belief in the bystanders that the fit was a reality, and he did not miss his aim in showing off his spasmodic attack, which was indeed done to the life. He was consequently exempted from hard labor and was permitted to employ himself in any trifling occupation he chose or in making Jews' harps, pen knives, knives of various descriptions, and rings, in the mechanism of which he displayed much original talent and characteristic ingenuity. Many persons, from mere curiosity purchased among the rest, may be instanced the case of two young men who very much admired his small penknives, and proposed purchasing two of them on condition of his engraving his name on the handles of them. He immediately engraved with perfect neatness Henry Moore Smith on one side of them, William Newman on the other side, and on the other knife he engraved Mysterious Stranger. These knives were kept by their owners as curiosities, and many persons were much gratified by seeing them. One of them was some time after brought to Kingston, and I myself had the gratification of seeing the name of my old domestic engraved on the handle. Under the indulgent treatment he received in Newgate, he became perfectly reconciled to his situation, manifesting no desire to leave it. Contentment, he said, is the brightest jewel in his life. And I was never more contented in my life. Consequently, he never attempted any means of escape. After the period of his imprisonment was up, and he had received his discharge, he left with the keeper of the prison a highly finished pocket knife of moderate size, the handle of which contained a watch, complete in all its parts, keeping time regularly. And what excited much wonder in reference to this ingenious and singularly curious piece of mechanism was the fact that he had never been found at work on any part of the watch or knife. And yet there was no doubt in the minds of those who saw it that it was in reality the production of his own genius and the work of his own hands. For this information I was indebted to a gentleman named Osborne who resided in the neighborhood and who stated that he had seen the watch and knife himself, and that it was regarded by all as a most wonderful piece of ingenuity. He left Simsbury decently apparelled, and with some money in his pocket, and in possession of some articles of his own handiwork. He directed his course eastward, and was seen in Boston, but for some time nothing particular or striking was heard of him. The first thing concerning him, that arrested public attention was published in the Boston Bulletin, and which came under my own eye. Beware of pickpockets! As the stagecoach, full of passengers, was on its way to this city a few evenings since, one of the passengers rang the bell and cried out to the driver to stop his horses, as his pockets had been picked of a large sum of money since he entered the coach and at the same time requested the driver would not let any of the passengers get out of the coach, it being dark, until he, the aforesaid passenger, should bring a light in order to have a general search. This caused a general feeling of pockets among the passengers, when another passenger cried out that his pocketbook had also been stolen. The driver did as directed until the gentleman who first spoke should have time to have procured a lamp, 
but whether he found it or not remained quite uncertain. But no doubt he found the light he intended should answer his purpose, as he did not make his appearance in any other light. However, the passenger who really lost his pocketbook, which, although it did not contain but a small amount of money, thinks he shall hereafter understand what is meant when a man in a stagecoach calls out, Thief, and that he will prefer darkness rather than light, if ever such an evil joke is offered to be played with him again. As he was continually changing his name, as well as his place, it was impossible always to identify his person, especially as few persons in the United States were personally acquainted with him. The difficulty of recognizing him was not a little increased, also, by the circumstances of his continually changing his external appearance, and the iniquitous means by which he could obtain money and change of apparel always afforded him a perfect facility of assuming a different appearance. In addition to these circumstances also as a feature of character which no less contributed to the difficulty of identifying him, must be taken into account his unequaled and inimitable ease in affecting different and various characters, and his perfect and unembarrassed composure in the most difficult and perplexing circumstances. To the identity and eccentricity, therefore, of his actions, rather than to our knowledge of the identity of his person and name, we must depend in our future attempts to trace his footsteps and mark their characteristic points. On this ground, therefore, there is not the shadow of a doubt that the robbery committed in the stagecoach and that the originality of the means by which he carried off his booty pointed with unhesitating certainty to the noted character of our narrative. After this depredation in the coach, with which he came off successful, it would appear that he bended his course in disguise through the states of Connecticut and New York, assuming different characters, and committing many robberies undiscovered and even unsuspected for a length of time, and afterwards make his appearance in Upper Canada in the character of a gentleman merchant from New Brunswick with a large quantity of smuggled goods from New York, which he said was coming on after him in wagons. These, he said, he intended to dispose of on very moderate terms so as to suit purchasers. Here he called upon my brother, Augustus Bates, deputy postmaster at Wellington Square, head of Lake Ontario, and informed the family that he was well acquainted with Sheriff Bates at Kingston, and that he called to let them know that he and his family were well. He regretted very much that he had not found Mr. Bates at home, and stated that he was upon urgent and important business and could not tarry with them for the night, but would leave a letter for him. This he accordingly did, properly addressed and in good handwriting, but when it was opened and its contents examined, no one in the place could make out the name of the writer or read any part of the letter. It appeared to have been written in the characters of some foreign language, but it could not be deciphered. This was another of his characteristic eccentricities, but his intention in it could not be well understood. He did not appear to make himself particularly known to the family, nor to cultivate any further acquaintance with them, but proceeded thence to the principal boarding house in the town and engaged entertainments for himself and thirteen other persons, who, he said, were engaged in bringing on his wagons, loaded with his smuggled goods. Having thus fixed upon a residence for himself and his gang of wagoners, he then called upon all the principal merchants in the town on pretense of entering into contracts for storing large packages of goods and promising to give great bargains to purchasers on their arrival, and, in some circumstances, actually received money as earnest on some packages of saleable goods for the sale of which he entered into contracts. It may be remarked, by the way, that he wrote also in an unknown and unintelligible hand to the celebrated Captain Brandt, the same as he had written to Mr. Bates, but with what view was equally mysterious and unaccountable. Notwithstanding his genteel and respectable appearance, there was a singularity in his manner and conduct which, with all his tact and experience, he could not altogether conceal, and hence arose some suspicions as to the reality of his pretensions. These suspicions received confirmation, and were soon matured into the reality of his being a genteel impostor, 
from the fact that the time for the arrival of his wagons was now elapsed, and that they were not making an appearance. At this juncture, when public attention and observation were directed to the stranger to observe which way the balance would turn, an individual named Brown, who had formerly resided in New Brunswick and moved with his family to Canada, coming into contact with the gentleman, recognized him from a certain mark he carried on his face to be the far-famed Henry Moore Smith, whom he had seen and known when in goal at Kingston. This report, passing immediately into circulation, gave the impostor a timely signal to depart without waiting for the arrival of his wagons and baggage, and without loss of time he took his departure from Canada, by the way of Lake Erie, through the Michigan Territory and down the Ohio to the southern states. With his proceedings during this course of his travels, we are entirely unacquainted. Therefore, the reader must be left to his own reflections as to his probable adventures as he traveled through this immense tract of country. There is no reason for doubt, however, that he had, by this time, and even long before, become so confirmed in his iniquitous courses that he would let no occasion pass unimproved that would afford him an opportunity of indulging in the predominant propensity of mind which seemed to glory in the prosecutions of robberies and plunder, as well as in the variety of means by which he effected his unheard-of and unprecedented escapes. After his arrival in the southern states, we are again able to glean something of his life and history, while it was yet in the goal at King's County. It will be remembered that he said he had been a preacher, and that he should preach again, and would gain proselytes. And now his predictions is brought about, for under a new name, that of Henry Hopkins, he appeared in the character of a preacher in the southern states. And what wonder! For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Here even in this character he was not without success for he got many to follow and admire him. Yet deep as his hypocrisy was, he seemed to be fully sensible of it, although his conscience had become seared and was proof against any proper sense of wrong. He acknowledged that he had been shocked to see so many follow him to hear him preach, and even to be affected under his preaching. Our source of information does not furnish us with any of the particulars which marked his conduct while itinerating through the South in his newly assumed character. Yet general accounts went on to say that he had, for a length of time, so conducted himself that he gained much popularity in his ministerial calling, and had a considerable number of adherents. However, this may have been the case for a length of time, yet as the assumption of this new character could not be attributable to any supernatural impulse, but was merely another feature of a character already so singularly diversified, intended as a cloak, under which he might, with less liability to suspicion, indulge the prevailing and all controlling propensities of his vitiated mind. It was not to be expected, with all the ingenuity he was capable of exercising, that he would long be able to conceal his real character. Accordingly, some misdemeanor which we have not been able to trace at length disclosed the hypocrisy of his character and placed him before his deluded followers in his true light. It would appear, whatever might have been the nature of his crime, that legal means were adopted for his apprehension and that in order to expedite his escape from the hands of justice, he had seized upon a certain gentleman's coach and horses and was traveling in the character of a gentleman in state when he was overtaken and apprehended in the state of Maryland. Here he was tried and convicted and sentenced to seven years' imprisonment in the state prison in Baltimore, which, from the nature of the climate, was generally believed would terminate his career. The particulars of this adventure I received in the city of New York in 1827, where I took much pains to obtain all possible information concerning his proceedings in the southern states while passing under the character of a preacher. In 1833 it so happened that I had occasion to visit the city of New York again, when I renewed my inquiries concerning him, but to no effect. No sources of information to which I had access yielded any account of him, 
and the most rational conjecture was that he either terminated his course in the state prison at Baltimore, or that one day, should he outlive the period of his confinement and be again let loose upon the peace of society, some fresh development of his character would point out the scene of his renewed depredations. In this painful state of obscurity, I was reluctantly obliged to leave the hero of our narrative on my return from New York. Another year had nearly elapsed before any additional light was thrown upon his history, but in an unexpected moment, when the supposition of his having ended his career in the prison at Baltimore was becoming fixed, I received by the politeness of a friend a file of the New York Times, one of the numbers of which contained the following article, bringing our adventurer again full into view in his usual characteristic style. Police office, robbery, and speedy arrest. A French gentleman from the South, so represented by himself, who has, for a few weeks past, under the name of Henry Bond, been running up a bill and running down the fare at the Franklin House, was this afternoon arrested at the establishment on the ungentlemanly charge of pillaging the trunks of lodgers. Since his sojourn, a variety of articles had disappeared from the chambers of the hotel, and amongst the rest about two hundred dollars from the trunk of one gentleman. No one, however, had thought of suspecting the French gentleman, who was also a lodger until this morning, when, unfortunately for him, his face was recognized by a gentleman who knew him to have been in the state prison at Baltimore. However, on searching him, which he readily complied with, not one cent of the money could be found, either upon his baggage or his person, but in lieu thereof they found him possessed of a large number of small keys, through which, no doubt, he found means of disposing of any surplus of circulating medium whereupon his quarters were changed to Bridewell until the ensuing term of general sessions. Here he remained in confinement until the period of his trial came round, when, for want of sufficient evidence to commit him to the state prison, he was thence discharged, and the next account we hear of him brings him before our view under the name of Henry Preston, arrested in the act of attempting to rob the northern mail coach, as will appear by the following article extracted from the Times. Police Office, Monday, February 22, 1835. Just as this office was closing on Saturday evening, a very gentlemanly-looking man, decently dressed, calling himself Henry Preston, was brought up in the custody of the driver and guard of the northern mail stage, who charged him with an attempt to rob the mail. The accusers testified that within a short distance of Peekskill they discovered the prisoner about a hundred yards ahead of the stage, and on approaching nearer they saw him jump over a fence, evidently to avoid notice. This, of course, excited their suspicion, and they kept an eye to the mail which was deposited in the boot. In the course of a short time, the guard discovered the rat nibbling at the bait and desiring the driver not to stop the speed of the horses, he quietly let himself down and found the prisoner actively employed, loosening the strap which confines the mailbag. He was instantly arrested, placed in the carriage, and carried to town free of expense. Having nothing to offer in extenuation of his offense, Mr. Henry Preston was committed to Bridewell until Monday for further investigation. Police Office Monday Morning this morning, Henry Preston, committed for attempting to rob the Northern Mail, was brought up before the sitting magistrates, when the High Sheriff of Orange County appeared, and demanded the prisoner, whose real name was Henry Gibney, as a fugitive from justice. He stated that the prisoner was to have been tried for grand larceny, and was lodged in the House of Detention at Newburgh, on Thursday, under care of two persons, that in the course of the night he eluded the vigilance of his keepers, escaped from confinement, and crossed the river on the ice, and had got down as far as Peekskill, where he says he attempted to get on top of the stage that he might get into New York as soon as possible. By order of the judges, the prisoner was delivered up to the sheriff of Orange County, 
to be recognized there for his trial for the offense with which he was originally charged at the next general session of the Supreme Court. But before the time came round, he had, as on most former occasions, contrived to make his escape and directed his course towards Upper Canada. Of the particular manner of his escape and his adventures on his way through to Canada, we can state nothing with certainty, but like all his previous movements, we may hazard the conjecture that they were such as would do the usual honor to his wretched profession. Yet with all his tact he could not always escape the hands of justice, and hence his course is not unfrequently interrupted and his progress impeded by the misfortunes of the prison. It is owing to this circumstance that we are enabled to keep pace with him in Upper Canada, where we find him confined in the goal of Toronto under the charge of burglary. For this information, the writer is indebted to his brother, Mr. Augustus Bates, residing in Upper Canada. From his letter, dated 4th August, 1835, we make the following extract, which will point out the circumstances which have guided us in endeavoring to follow up the history of the mysterious stranger to the present time. Dear brother, I now sit down to acknowledge the receipt of a number of your letters, especially your last by Mr. Samuel Nichols, in which you mentioned that you were writing a new edition of Moore Smith. I have to request that you will suspend the publication until you hear from me again. There is a man now confined in Toronto Goal who bears the description of Moore Smith and is supposed to be the same. Many things are told of him which no other person could perform. I will not attempt to repeat them, as I cannot vouch for their truth. From current reports, I was induced to write to the sheriff, who had him in charge, requesting him to give me a correct account of him. I have not heard from the sheriff since I wrote. Perhaps he is waiting to see in what manner he is to be disposed of. Report says the man is condemned to be executed for shop-breaking. He wishes the sheriff to do his duty, that he had much rather be hanged than sent to the penitentiary. Many are the curious stories told of him, which, as I said before, I will not vouch for. Should the sheriff write to me, his information may be relied on. Several communications from Upper Canada have reached us between the date of the letter from which the above extract is made and the present time, but none of them contained the desired information as to the particular fate of the prisoner and the manner in which he was disposed of until the 8th of September last, 1836. By a letter from Mr. Augustus Bates bearing this date, it would appear that the prisoner had not been executed, but had been sentenced to one year's confinement in the penitentiary. We make the following extract. I give you all the information I can obtain respecting the prisoner inquired after. The goaler, who is also the deputy sheriff that had him in charge, says he could learn nothing from him, said he called his name Smith that he was fifty-five years old, but denies that he was ever in Kingston, New Brunswick. The jailer had one of your books and showed it to him, but he denied any knowledge of it, and would not give any satisfaction to the inquiries he made of him. The sheriff says he believes the person to be the same mysterious stranger, that he was condemned and sentenced to the penitentiary for one year. His crime was burglary. It would have afforded the writer of these memoirs great satisfaction, and no doubt an equal satisfaction to the reader, had it been in his power to have paid a visit to Upper Canada, that he might be able to state, from his own certain and personal knowledge of the prisoner at Toronto, that he was indeed the selfsame noted individual that was in his custody twenty-two years ago, and whom he had the gratification of seeing and recognizing subsequently at the Simsbury Mines, where he played off his affected fits with such art and consequent advantage. But although it is not in the writer's power to close up his memoir with so important and valuable a discovery, yet keeping in view the characteristic features of the man, his professed ignorance of Kingston and New Brunswick, his denial of ever having seen the first edition of the memoirs, and the care which he took to keep himself enveloped in mystery, 
by utterly declining to give any satisfactory information concerning himself. All these circumstances united form a combination of features so marked as to carry conviction to the mind of the reader who has traced him through this narrative, that he is no other than the same mysterious Henry Moore Smith. There is another feature in the prisoner at Toronto that seems strangely corroborative of what we are desirous properly to establish. That is, his age. He acknowledges to be fifty-five years of age, and although this would make him somewhat older than his real age, yet it fixes this point, that the prisoner at Toronto was well advanced in years, and so must the subject of our memoirs be also. From information which we have obtained, it seems that he has undergone his trial, and was committed to the penitentiary for a year's confinement. Whether he found any means of effecting an exemption from labor in the penitentiary and then reconciling himself to his confinement, or whether he accomplished one of his ingenious departures, we are unable to determine. One thing, however, is highly probable, that he is again going up and down in the earth in the practice of his hoary-headed villainy, except power from on high has directed the arrow of conviction to heart. For no inferior impulse would be capable of giving a new direction to the life and actions of a man whose habits of iniquity have been ripened into maturity and obtained an immovable ascendancy by the practice of so many successive years. It must be acknowledged that there is an unprecedented degree of cleverness in all his adventures, which casts a kind of elusive and momentary covering over the real character of his actions, and would seem to engage an interest in his favor. And this is an error to which the human mind seems remarkable, predisposed, when vice presents itself before us in all its cleverness. Yet who can read his miserable career without feeling pained at the melancholy picture of depravity it presents? Who would have supposed that after his condemnation and sentence at Kingston, and his life, by an act of human mercy given into his hands again, he would not have hastened to his sorrowing little wife, and with tears of compunction mingled with those of joy, cast himself upon her neck and resolved by a course of future rectitude and honesty to make her as happy as his previous disgraceful and sinful career had made her miserable. But ah, no! His release was followed by no such effects, rendered unsusceptible for every natural and tender impression, and yet under the full dominion of the God of this world, he abandoned the intimate of his bosom and set out single-handed in the fresh pursuit of crime. There is, however, one redeeming feature which stands out among the general deformities of his character. In all the adventures which the history of his course presents to our view, we are not called upon to witness any acts of violence and blood, and it is perhaps owing to the absence of this repulsive trait of character that we do not behold him in a more relentless light. End of Henry Moore Smith, The Mysterious Stranger by Walter Bates